Good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are. On behalf of the president of the Linnaean Society of London, Professor Sandy Knapp, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, I wish you a very warm welcome to this two-day international conference, Evolution on Purpose, Teleonomy in Living Systems. My name's Dick Vainwright, and I will be your host for the first day and a half of this two-day event. But before we start, as a fellow of the Linnaean Society, I'd like to say a little about the origins and aspirations of, uh, the, of our organization. Founded 233 years ago, and named in honor of the creator of the now universal system of nomenclature for naming and classifying living organisms, Carl Linnaeus, the Linnaean Society of London is perhaps now best known for its role in 1858, when it hosted the first public presentation by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace of their theory of evolution by natural selection. Now the oldest extant biological society in the world, the Linnaean Society remains very active in its mission to help create a world where nature is better understood, valued and protected. The society encourages debate and discussion of natural history, including taxonomy, evolutionary biology and ecology, and supports all efforts to address urgent issues affecting the natural world, including climate change and biodiversity loss. Members or fellows as they are known, come from all walks of life and include anyone passionate about the natural world. The fellowship is international and includes world leaders in natural history who use the society's platforms to communicate advances in their fields. Anyone interested in fellowship can get the necessary information from the Linnaean Society of London website. I do hope some of you attending this meeting who are not members will feel inspired to join. Like all societies, the membership is the fundamental source of its energy and activity. Now, I turn to this meeting. <clears throat> this meeting forms part of the society's proud tradition of encouraging debate and discussion about natural history and evolutionary biology in particular. Although now widely accepted that living systems e exhibit an internal teleology or teleonomy, as we prefer to call it, the full implications of this distinctive biological property have yet to be explored. This online conference seeks to address this phenomenon, its scope and meaning, and its many forms and facets. The organizers, Peter Corning, Padma, Ghosh, and myself, in collaboration with professors Eva Jablonska, Stuart Kaufman, Dennis Noble, Samir Okasha, James Shapiro, and Dennis Walsh, have put together an international group of leaders in this field. We very much hope that you will enjoy this two-day conference, Evolution on Purpose, Teleonomy in Living Systems. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to start our two-day international online conference uh, on the very subject, Evolution on Purpose, with a positioning statement from our lead organizer, Peter Corning. The title of Peter's introductory presentation, which has been pre-recorded, is Teleonomy in Evolution, the Ghost in the Machine. Padma, perhaps you could uh, roll the, uh, the video. I'm going to share it now. Yes, this is Peter Corning from the Institute for the Study of Complex Systems. Uh, and the title of my talk is Teleonomy in Evolution, the Ghost in the Machine. And I'll elaborate on that uh, metaphor a little bit later on in my talk. Uh, I'm taking the liberty of recording this because it would be five o'clock in the morning uh, my time. And I think I'd be better, uh, a little bit better uh, doing it at a more respectable time and recording it instead. Uh, so let me begin by trying to uh, clarify the important concept of teleonomy. As some of you know, it's a variant of the more familiar term teleology. It was coined by the biologist Colin Pittendrick in connection with the landmark 1957 Conference on Behavior and Evolution and the edited volume that uh, followed from that. 
uh, Pittendrick was seeking to draw a contrast between an externally imposed tele teleology, such as an Aristotelian or religious teleology, and the internal purposiveness and goal directedness of living systems, which arises out of the evolutionary process and the workings of natural selection. Pittendrick himself characterized teleonomy as a fundamental property of biological phenomena, including their behavior. Similarly, the Nobel biologist Jacques Monod in his influential 1971 book, Chance and Necessity, concluded, quote, all the structures, all the performances, all the activities contributing to the essential project of life will hence be called teleonomic. It is the very definition of living beings. The eminent 20th century biologist Theodosius Dubchansky also concurred with his view, although he used a different terminology, he called it an internal or natural teleology. However, Ernst Meyer, one of the architects of the modern synthesis and evolutionary biology strongly disagreed with this definition. In his important 1974 essay on teleological and teleonomic, a new analysis, Meyer framed teleonomy as requiring a pre-existing goal and quote, something material that guides and controls a process to a determinable end. In living organisms, Meyer said this a priori goal entails a program it was an analogy that Meyer borrowed from computers and it was an obvious reference to the genome. Meyer was adamant that it is inappropriate to attribute purposiveness to the processes of natural selection and he opposed applying the term teleonomy to any quote static biological system, meaning the anatomical features of an organism. Meyer also insisted that quote, it is misleading and quite inadmissible to de designate such broadly generalized concepts as survival or reproductive success as definite and specified goals. Teleonomy does not exist outside the ultimately determinative influence of DNA and the genetic program. In short, Meyer was an apostle of the modern synthesis and the core assumption that almost everything in evolution could be reduced to the genome and genetic mutations and the winnowing effect of natural selection. In fact, Meyer identified only genetic and ecological causes for natural selection. Unfortunately, though, there was a ghost in the machine. In fact, there were several ghosts. I borrowed this metaphor from Arthur Kessler's famous critique of Descartes' dualism back in the 1960s. I, I think it's appropriate. Among other things, we now know that symbiosis between different organisms is a widespread phenomenon in the natural world and that symbiogenesis has had a major influence in shaping the evolutionary process. Also important are the many influences that go under the heading of developmental plasticity, the processes that lie between the genome and the mature phenotype. We also know that horizontal or lateral gene transfers are ubiquitous in the bacterial world and that rapid purposeful changes in single-celled organisms can be affected without depending on mutational processes and natural selection reproduction. There is also the burgeoning evidence that the genome is in fact a two-way read-write system as Jim Shapiro calls it. There are for instance the increasing examples of epigenetic inheritance or changes in the phenotype that are transmitted back to the germplasm in the next generation. Recent progress in microbiology has also shown that an overwhelming majority of DNA changes in the genome are the result of internal regulatory and control networks, not random mutations and incremental additive selection. Rapid genome alteration can be achieved by a variety of mobile DNA modules, transposons, integrons, CRISPRs, retroposons, variable antigen determinants, and more. But most important, almost 100 years of research in ethology and animal learning, behavior, and culture has shown that the evolved pur purposes, initiatives, and choices of living organisms themselves 
has had a significant role in shaping the course of evolution. Natural selection via niche construction theory represents just one important aspect of animal behavior. So the causal role of teleonomy and evolution is hardly a new idea. Indeed, the basic idea can be traced back even to Lamarck, as well as to the half-life of organic selection theory at the turn of the 20th century. I should also note as an aside or a footnote that even Ernst Meyer recognized the role of goal-directed behaviors in his writings. He considered them very important sources of evolutionary change and he called them evolutionary pacemakers, his words. However, he did not include this insight in his formal definition of teleonomy. It was a bit perverse. But Meyer was hardly alone. Biologists over the years have routinely downplayed the teleonomic properties and behaviors of living systems. With euphemisms like functions, adaptations, or products of natural selection without acknowledging the ghost in the machine. Perhaps the best way to appreciate the causal role of teleonomy in shaping the trajectory of evolution is to focus on the causes of natural selection. Natural selection is often portrayed as being some sort of external mechanism or force out there in the environment somewhere which actively determines differential success in the struggle for life, as Darwin put it. In fact, it was Darwin himself who began the practice of reifying natural selection. In the first edition of The Origin of Species, he famously wrote, quote, natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world, every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, silently and insensibly working, whenever and wherever opportunity offers at the improvement of each organic being. Only in a later edition of The Origin did Darwin add the all-important clarifying phrase, it may metaphorically be said. In other words, Darwin acknowledged that natural selection is not really a mechanism or an agent or a force. It does not actually do anything. It's a way of labeling a consequential happening in the natural world. Living organisms are in fact contingent dynamic phenomena and they must actively seek to survive and reproduce. This existential problem requires that an organism must be goal directed in an immediate proximate sense. So natural selection refers to whatever factors are responsible in a given context for causing differential survival and reproduction. B.F. Skinner, the prominent 20th century psychologist called it selection by consequences. These causal factors are intensely interactional and relational. They're caused by both the organism and its behavior in a specific environment. A textbook illustration of this model involves the so-called peppered moth first studied by HBD Kettlewell in the 1950s. Before the Industrial Revolution, Biston betularia, a light-colored cryptic species of moss, predominated in the English countryside over a darker melanic form. The mottled wing coloration of the B. betularia provided camouflage from the predatory birds as the moss rested on the trunks of lichen-encrusted trees. But as industrial soot progressively blackened the tree trunks in areas close to growing industrial cities, the relative frequency of the two moth forms was reversed. The birds began to prey more heavily on the now more visible cryptic moths and literally overlooked the melanic form. So the question is, where in this example is natural selection? The short answer is that it involved the entire configuration of factors that combine to influence differential survival and reproduction. In this case, an alteration in the relationship between the background color of the trees and the wing pigmentation of the moths as a consequence of industrial pollution was a, an important proximate factor. But this was important only because of the inflexible resting behavior of the moths and the feeding habits and perceptual abilities of the birds. Had the moths been subject only to insect eating bats, 
that use a form of sonar to catch insects on the wing, the change in background coloration of the trees would not have made any difference. Nor would it have made any difference if there were not genetically based differences in the wing coloration between the two forms. There would have been no differential selection. One other example of this causal dynamic closer to home for me would be, could be found in the rainforest of the Olympic National Park in the state of Washington, excuse me, where there is intense competition among the towering evergreen trees in a crowded forest canopy. The hemlocks produce by far the most seeds and are the best adapted to growing in the low sunlight conditions of the park. However, it's the Sitka spruce that dominate and the reason is that they, uh, there's an abundance of Roosevelt elk in the park and the elk feed heavily on young hemlock trees and do not feed on the Sitka spruce. In other words, the food preferences of the elk are the proximate cause of differential survival, natural selection between the hemlock and the spruce trees. The punch times these two examples is simply this, both the evolved anatomy and physiology and the behavioral strategies and choices of living organisms, along with the natural environment, greatly influence natural selection and evolution. I call this dynamic teleonomic selection or natural selection as a consequence of the purposes, properties, and actions of living systems. And in fact, teleonomic, uh, teleonomic selection has been a major theme or through line in the history of life on earth. As Dennis Walsh noted in his 1915 book on agency and evolution, living systems also enact evolution. This evolutionary dynamic has traveled under various alias aliases over time, symbiogenesis, organic selection, the Baldwin effect, evolutionary pacemakers, gene culture, coevolution theory, major transitions theory, niche construction theory, agency, and more. The most remarkable example of this dynamic, I would argue, can be found in the evolution of humankind. Our species has been shaped over time by our behavioral innovations and their consequences. In my 2018 book on synergistic selection, I proposed that there were three keys to our ancestors extraordinary success over time, close social cooperation, adaptive innovations, and functional synergies or the economic benefits. Our bi bipedal, remote bipedal ancestors, the Australopithecines were quite small, about three feet tall and relatively slow moving. They could not have survived the harsh physical challenges in the living, living on the ground nor could they have held their own against the many large predators in their East African environment in those days without foraging together closely in cooperative groups and defending themselves together in collectively with the tools they invented for procuring food and for self-defense. Probably digging, digging sticks and that doubled as clubs and probably thrown rocks. The result was a game changer cooperative outcomes that could not otherwise be achieved. We know because we have evidence of predation on the skeletons that we recovered of Australopithecines. Um, they were subject to many predators, including pack hunters like the Pala hyena. The other transition in our evolution uh, as a species followed the same basic formula. Cooperation and innovation were underlying themes and the synergies that were produced, the economic benefits were the reason why our ancestors cooperated and why they were successful. Thus the emergence of much larger and bigger brained Homo erectus about 2 million years ago was a product of a synergistic joint venture namely the hunting of big game animals in closely cooperative groups with the aid of an array of potent new tools, finely balanced throwing spears, hand axes, cutting tools, carriers, and eventually fire and cooking. It's true that there was a major opportunity for many large game animals in their environment, 
but our ancestors invented the strategies and tools for being able to exploit them. Likewise, the final emergence of modern humankind, perhaps as early as 300,000 years ago, represented a further elaboration of this collective survival strategy. It was novel economic synergies that enabled the evolution of much larger groups. Each tribe was in effect a coalition of many biological families that was sustained by a sophisticated array of new technologies, shelters, clothing, food processing, food preservation, storage techniques, and, and much more. Especially important were the more efficient new hunting and gathering tools like spear throwers, which greatly increased their range and accuracy, uh, bows and arrows, nets and traps, and a variety of fishing techniques. Indeed, culture itself, including spoken language, became a powerful engine of cumulative evolutionary change. As a zoologist, Jonathan Kingdon put it in the title of his book length study of human evolution, we are the self-made man. How do we know? Because many of these cultural changes seem to have occurred many generations before the key anatomical changes. To summarize then, the internal teleology or teleonomy of living systems has had a major influence over the course of evolution. However, this internal teleology does not guarantee foresight, nor does it reflect the law of unintended, unintended consequences, like the oxygenation of the atmosphere long ago or climate change today, nor does it guarantee that an animal will make the right choices, the adaptive choices in response to the challenges of living. In the 1950s, the well-known comedian Mort Saul liked to say with tongue in cheek, the future lies ahead. The biologist Garrett Hardin in a classic essay back in the mid century concluded, we cannot predict evolution, but we can make it. So we must choose wisely. I'll end it with that. And uh, if Padma, can arrange it, I have a, a one page recapitulation, a set of bullet points outlining uh, the major points in my talk. And I'll, I'll end it here. Well, thank you very much, Peter, in absentia. Uh, uh, I'll just read those bullet points uh, if it helps. Um, so this is a summary of Peter Corning's talk. Biologist uh, Colin Petendrich coined the term teleonomy to denote the internal teleology of all living systems. Biologists Jacques Monod, Theodosius Dobzhansky and many others agreed, but Ernst Meyer strongly disagreed. Meyer, an architect of the modern synthesis, defined teleonomy as requiring a pre-existing program. We now know there are many ghosts in Meyer's machine. These include symbiogenesis, lateral gene transfers, developmental plasticity, epigenetic inheritance, mobile DNA modules, and especially behavior and culture. Teleonomy exerts a major influence in natural selection. Two examples of teleonomic selection are industrial melanism in peppered moths and the predominance of the Sitka spruce in the Olympic rainforest. The most remarkable example of behavior as an influence on in evolution is humankind. We are the self-made self man or self-made people, if you like. Biologist Garrett Hardin concluded, we cannot predict evolution, but we can make it. So we must choose wisely. Uh, okay. Um, well, that forms a very useful uh, sort of set of points uh, for the kickstart to our conference. So thank you again, Peter. We have a few minutes before our next talk. 
which gives me an opportunity to say a few things about the meeting and what will follow. First, although many presentations will be live, questions to presenters can only be dealt with at the end of the second day during the two hour session starting tomorrow at 1730 Greenwich Mean Time. So if you have points that you're burning to make, please be sure to keep a note of them as we go along. Next, just a little follow up on just a little on the follow up to this event. First, all sessions are being recorded and after a few days, all will be available online and will be accessible for many months and probably years to come. All, registr all registrants will be informed by email how they can access these recordings. Two sets of papers are planned for publication. These will cover most, hopefully all of the talks presented today and tomorrow, together with additional contributions, most of which are already agreed, but there is a scope for a few more yet, I think. One set will be published as an edited volume by MIT Press in their Vienna series in theoretical biology under the conference title, Evolution on Purpose, Teleonomy in Living Systems. The other set will appear as a special issue of the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society, which I think has its, has its subtitle, a Journal of Evolution. Finally, it's our intention that all talks today and tomorrow should start almost exactly on time. Speakers have been asked not to exceed 29 minutes. They're all half hour slots. At 25 minutes, if necessary, I shall intervene in live presentations to indicate four minutes left. And at 28 minutes, I will ask speakers to draw their talks to an end. I'm afraid this is necessary with respect to those who may join for specific presentations only, but perhaps even more importantly, to ensure all speakers have equal opportunity. If some talks end a little early, this will give a little space for reflection or maybe more pressing matters, who knows. All talks are intended to start at the published time, not earlier and not later. And I might add that if we have, let's hope not, some catastrophic uh, internet failure affecting one or other speakers, uh, I propose if in that event that we put on the screen the summary for their talk and uh, uh, hopefully an indication that the conference will uh, proceed uh, 25 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, later uh, at the appointed time. So in case we have a real problem, which we can't fix with any of the presentations, uh, we will start again with the next presentation at the appointed time on your programs, which hopefully you all have. Now. Okay, so we still have a few minutes. So if anybody needs to uh, tend to pressing matters, we will be starting at 1.30 with uh, Dr. or 1.30 my time uh, in two minutes with Dr. Arvid Agren from Harvard. So just a few minutes uh, reflection between now and then. Thank you. Should I start, uh, Dick, or should? Uh... Well, I'll just give it another thirty seconds or so, and then we'll start. All right? I'm I see. Uh, we're just about ready. All right. 
just let me know. Yep. Okay, I think we're more or less at 1.30 in my local time here, or however that translates around the world. Our next talk is by Dr. Arvid Agren. Agren. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to, quite how to pronounce your name. You'll do it right in a minute for us all. From Harvard. The title of Arvid's talk is The Paradox of the Organism Revisited. So over to you and thank you. There you go. Thank you, uh, Nick, for the uh, introduction and for, to you and the organizers for putting together such an exciting meeting. My name is uh, Arvid uh, Ogren. Uh, I split my time between uh, Harvard uh, University in the US and Uppsala University in uh, Sweden. I'm an evolutionary biologist who's primarily been interested in the biology of genomic conflicts and how they fit into our general models of social evolution. And that is also very much the angle from which I come to the topic of this meeting and kind of the central claim that I will put forward today is that any account of organismal agency need to take within organism conflicts uh, seriously. I, and I've structured my talk around kind of three stories or three broad themes. The first introduced the foundations and assumptions of the so-called gene side view of evolution. I will then introduce the concept of the paradox of the organism and what, does, what that does to the tradition in evolutionary theory that have model agency with the individual as a maximizing agent analogy. And then finally, I will end with kind of highlighting why I think the study of genomic conflicts over the last few decades provide an interesting window or case study into the disagreements within the field over the value of the language or purpose in biology. Now, the genes of view of evolution has been an influential but contentious perspective in evolutionary theory for the past half century. It was first introduced by the American George Williams in Adaptation and Natural Selection uh, in a book that was largely aimed at professional biologists, which means that most are introduced to these arguments in the more confrontational language of Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene, which was published 10 years later. Now, the central claim of this perspective is to borrow William's terms is that organisms are two temporary of occurrences to play the central role in our evolutionary explanations. He argued that they were a unique combination of genotype and environment and their interaction, present in one generation, gone in the next. And he contrasted this with what he called, uh, with, with the genes, which he then by this term meant alleles as we treat them in theoretical population genetics. And they, in contrast then, are they assumed to be passed on intact from one generation to the next and therefore become the ultimate beneficiary of selection. Now, the genes I view occupies a rather peculiar position within theoretical biology. It is not a straightforward empirical hypothesis, although you can certainly help us come up with such. Is not a general mathematical framework, though you can certainly inspire more formal models to be developed. Instead, it's more akin to a way of thinking. Bill Hamilton, in his review of the Selfish Gene for Science, described it as a new way to read nature. And similarly, Richard Dawkins has described it as a particular way of looking at animals and plants and a particular way of wondering why they do the things they do. Now, now ever since then, the genes I view has attracted both strong critics and fierce, uh, strong supporters and fierce critics, both among professional biologists and among lay people. And a good example of a fierce critic is uh, Mary Midgley, the, the, uh, the philosopher, the late philosopher, who over many years developed a critique of the genes I view. And while I don't care much for much of her criticisms, she said uh, towards the very end of her life in an interview, she described the selfish gene as a rotten essay in moral philosophy propped up by bad scientific examples. And I like this quote because I think it very much illustrates what is at stake. What is at stake is both the science of biology and how we describe it, but also its moral implications. 
And that indeed is very much the theme of a book that I've written on the topic for Oxford University Press, which will be published uh, next uh, month in the United Kingdom. The aim of this book is to try to understand the debates that has surrounded the genes I view over the past 50 odd years. And it does so kind of by tackling kind of four central questions. And that is what it is, uh, where it came from, the kind of historical intellectual milieu, milieu from which it grew, uh, grew, grew out, how it developed and changed in light of the criticism that it received, a lot of it fair, some of it not so much, but also see how and how it fits into contemporary evolutionary theory. And if anything, the central uh, claim of the book is that the genes I've used is a powerful thinking tool, especially when we're interested in working out the logic of natural selection. But like with all tools, to get the most out of it, you must understand what problem it was designed to solve. And the genes I view has pr primarily been uh, interested in working out uh, the logic of natural selection. And a lot of those kind of puzzles have come from the study of social behavior. And indeed, the genes I view initially earned its stripes by making sense of all problems in social behavior, particularly those related to the genetics of altruism and other forms of costly cooperation. And this point was made very nicely by John Maynard Smith in an essay that he wrote for the New Scientist magazine in 1985. Now, this essay was commissioned because it was the 10 year anniversary of E.O. Wilson's sociobiology. But in the essay, Maynard Smith make a point that taking a gene side view of the world has changed how we study social evolution at its deepest level. In addition to help us make sense of all problems, it has also pointed out new problems. And in particular, Maynard Smith highlighted that it showed that social evolution is not just something that happens between organisms and groups, but also within organisms. And he ends the essay in this way, that how did it come about that most genes, most of the time, play fair so that the gene success depends only on the success of the individual that carries it? Because what biologists at the time of this essay had begun to realize, and what we now know with full force, is that there are a lot of ways for genes to play unfair. These days, we usually refer to these genes as selfish genetic elements. These are genes that have the ability to transmit, uh, to promote their own transmission, even if it comes at the expense of other genes in the genome or indeed the fitness of the individual organism. And the, the kind of the biology of self genetic elements and genomic conflict is truly a weird and wonderful world, with each example being slightly more bizarre than the next. We have things like segregation distorters and meiotic drivers that interfere with the process of meiosis. And instead of ending up in 50% of the gametes as mandated by Mendel's laws of inheritance, they end up in 90, 95, 99% of all the gametes. Here's things like homing endonucleases that when present in a heterozygote, damages the cystic copy, uses itself as a template to repair it, and now by virtue of being homozygous, guarantees its own transmission. Here's things like transposable elements that have the ability to make copies of themselves and then insert into new locations in the genome, something which has own, earned them the nickname jumping genes. Finally, another major class of genomic conflict is that there arises between maternally inherited genes, such as in the mitochondria, and but uh, biparentally inherited genes in the nuclear genome over sex allocation in hermaphroditic plants. While the kind of what we now know as selfish genetic elements have been known for almost a century, it's only more recently that the biological significance of them have begun to be appreciated. We now know that they are involved in everything from providing the genetic basis of the, the pepper moth um, textbook example, the underlying reproductive isolation in plants, and cause several kinds of cancer in humans. But they also have deeper, more philosophical implications. And one of the first to recognize this was Bill Hamilton. He had written already in the 1960s on how conflicts between autosomes and sex chromosomes can cause deviations from the 50-50 sex ratio leading to what he called extraordinary sex ratios. And when he reflected upon this in his uh, collected papers in the 1990s, he wrote that seemingly inescapable conflict within diploid organisms 
uh, came to me as both as a new agonizing challenge and at the same time as a release from personal problems I had had all my life. Given my realization of an eternal disquiet within, what a hauntingly beautiful phrase, eternal disquiet within, uh, couldn't I feel better about my own inability to be consistent in what I was doing, about, my, about indecisions in matters range, ranging from daily trivialities up to the very nature of right and wrong. As I write these words, even as able to write them, I am pret pretending to a unity that deep inside ourselves I know does not exist. I am fundamentally mixed, male with female, parent with offspring, warring segments of chromosomes. And this then, this kind of unity that deep inside myself I know does not exist, then leads to this concept of the paradox of the organism, a term that was first coined by Dawkins in 1990. And the idea of the paradox of the organism is that we know that there are all these opportunities for um, agents like subgenetic elements and cancer cells to erode organisms from the inside. They usually do not. And most of the time, organisms appear as closely related, integrated, uh, purposive, purposive holes. But this is kind of what I, how I entered into thinking of this topic. And I kind of am quite interested in what happens to our notions of purpose, philonomy, organismal agency, in light of this presence of entities within the organism that do not work uh, for the general interest or the organism itself. So I'm asking then, how does, um, what happens to notions of purpose and teleonomy in light of genomic context? Well, one way to approach it is to look at how kind of classical approaches to agency uh, would handle it. So in a recent paper, Hugh Desmond and Philip Hunnaman described two such classical uh, approaches. The first they call the Neurosatelian option, where in here agency is somehow part of life's uh, ontology. Um, they, and they, in their description of it, they kind of highlight examples like Dennis Walsh's uh, recent book on this topic, as well as that of Alvaro Moreno and Matthew uh, Mossimo. They contrast this Aristotelian option with what they call a neo fisherian option. Here, agency is merely uh, epistemic. It is a heuristic and kind of a shorthand for selectionist uh, explanations. And this then gets its name from Fisher's fundamental theorem. Uh, and perhaps more recently, uh, Alan Grafen's formal Darwinism project. Now, the genes of you share a kind of a deep intellectual lineage with the, the Fisherian option. And indeed, I would argue that uh, it's Fisher's ideas that very much provides the underpinning of the genes I view of uh, evolution. So kind of, I'm particularly interested in how these perspectives then can handle the paradox of the organism. And particularly perhaps Alan Grafen's ambitious formal Darwinism project. This is a project that he's been working on since the uh, mid 1990s and it's published, led to publications in both biological, philosophical and mathematical uh, journals. The central goal of the formal Darwinism project is to provide a, what he calls a mathematical bridge between on the one hand, the dynamic models of population genetics that describes changes in allele frequencies. And then on the other hand, the optimality models that describe fitness maximization. Um, the kind of central goal then is to justify the idea of the individual as a maximizing agent analogy. This, so this very much is a tradition that seeks to capture agency in terms of selection uh, explanations. And kind of Grafen has argued that the, the analogy that the individual ought to appear as maximizing something is taken for granted by many, many empirical biologists, particularly those who study behavior ecology uh, in the field, but that this uh, assumption lacks a formal grounding. So we can ask then, how does something like uh, the formal Darwinism models handle the paradox of the organism? And at first glance, it seems uh, not, not so well. Grafen's models assume a genomic unity of purpose, to, to borrow a great phrase from Samir Kasha. Uh, in other words, that there are no genomic conflicts, that all genes are working for the same uh, purpose, and that is to maximize an individual's inclusive fitness. And kind of the implicit, implicit assumption that justifies these models is that if our goal is to understand organismal adaptations, such conflict can safely be ignored. 
indeed is perhaps would be one of the my greatest source of disagreements with this general project. Uh, and I think in particular, because they tend to lead to a tendency to downplay uh, within organism conflicts, you tend to kind of ignore this really exciting part of biology that happens within organisms in order to, to kind of save the individual as a central unit of explanation in biology. So one example of this is a paper that in many ways I quite like is from uh, Tom Scott and, 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 and Stu uh, West uh, uh, in Oxford, who tackled in 2019 this very question of what happens to individual level fitness maximization in the presence of genomic conflicts. So what they did to, to address it was that they used a series of population genetic models to model the biology of selfish genetic elements. But they argue that, and they show that selfish genetic elements would either be the fitness cost would be too weak to be important, or if the fitness effects are large, they will be readily suppressed by other genes. So genes will evolve mutations that can suppress the, the activity of the selfish genetic elements. And in light of this, uh, West, uh, Scott and West argue that you don't really need to worry about uh, genomic conflict if you want to understand all the small uh, phenotypes. I think the problem with this approach is that it actually does not show how individual fitness maximization can be achieved in the presence of self-genetic elements um, in the first place, but only how it can be maintained once it's there. The, the assumption in the, all their models is that an organism is already maximizing its fitness. And then they ask, can the presence of a genomic conflict knock it off this adaptive peak? And they show, uh, not surprising that it can, can not. And I think this kind of implicit bias saves the individual here as the, the only fitness maximizing uh, entity. Um, now, uh, luckily though, I think that there is something really interesting that the, the formal Darwin project has to offer the, the, the question of uh, what happens to fitness maximization in light of genomic uh, conflicts. And that is because the same tools that Grafen used at the level of the organism can be moved down a level and applied to the gene and treating the gene as an inclusive fitness maximizing agent. Um, this has kind of been a, a product that's been pushed forward uh, by uh, Andy Garnett during the past uh, decade. Uh, but I think, uh, unfortunately, it hasn't really been picked up by, by by many others. Uh, and while I think there are uh, limitations in, uh, in, in these uh, models, uh, for sure, I do think that they represent a very exciting opportunity. Uh, especially that so far, uh, what Gardner has done is that he's modeled, he's kind of gone, instead of modeling the individual as a maximum age at the level of the organism, you simply move it down to the level of gene and kind of ask what happens if you take these organismal tools and apply them to the gene. But what, what hasn't been done is that what happens when you have two levels of agency, both the gene and the organism, and they come into conflict. Um, and that is very much the, um, the, the theme of some work that I, will go do, uh, that I will do going forward together with a collaborator of mine, Manus Patton from uh, Georgetown. We've just recently been awarded a, a three-year grant from John Templeton Foundation to develop a formal account of the paradox uh, of the organism. And kind of the key question at the heart of this account is how and when does the fitness optimal of different genetic entities differ enough that it no longer makes sense to talk uh, of the organism as a cohesive whole? In other, in other words, that the organism is not this kind of cohesive fitnessizing entity, but very much uh, an adaptive compromise between different uh, entities. And I think you can almost talk of a kind of a, the organism as a consequence or a product of uh, teleonomic blending rather than as a single unit that, that is uh, where teleonomy can be assigned. So kind of in this effort to bring genomic conflicts into our thinking of teleonomy, I think it's also particularly interesting because there is this uh, disagreement within the field of genomic conflict of how we should handle uh, this kind of purposeful uh, language that over the past decades, genomic conflicts and the biology of self-genetic elements have been modeled by 
uh, researcher from different traditions within evolutionary theory. That on the one hand, you have people who are broadly interested in social evolution, usually coming from fields like behavioral ecology, who have come to the study of genomic context because it offers a new interesting example of that. Uh, and with them, they bring methods like game theory and a language that's, that's quite comfortable with notions of strategies and purpose. And that is then has clashed with a tradition from uh, theoretical population genetics, which is very uncomfortable with such language and simply want to model it as uh, just a different example of changes in allele frequencies. I find a kind of a good illustration of what I mean is the review uh, of genes in conflict that uh, Brian Charlesworth wrote. So genes in conflict was written by Orson Burt and Robert Trivers in 2006. And despite having some 15 years since it was published, it probably is still the go-to book on the biology of genomic conflict. It's a magnificent kind of collection of all the different parts of this weird and wonderful world. And Brian, who anyway, very much can be described as one of the, the grand old men of a British population genetics, uh, praised the book in, in his review, but, and he, but he went on to say that his only serious complaint is that the book is light on the theory underlying the interpretation that are offered, and that the language is often surprisingly anthropomorphic. And he goes, says that genes of genetic animals do not want anything. Evolution is a purely mechanistic process of shifts in frequency of genetic variants of one kind uh, or another. And in many ways, this is kind of a common complaint that you hear both on the study of genomic conflicts and the genes I view in general. Um, here's a kind of collection of some of my favorite insults that have been hurled at this approach to evolution. Lucy Sullivan, for example, in a commentary on a paper on mitonuclear conflict by Bill Hamilton and Lawrence Hurst, described their approach at the Oxford School of Biological Science Fiction. Similarly, the plant scientist David Hankey described biology as sick uh, from suffering from this. And uh, similarly, the uh, philosophers Alex Rosenberg and Peter Godfrey Smith have also provided some absolute, excellent insult describing the approach as suffering from Darwinian paranoia or being conspiracy theorists, uh, respectively. So taken together then, the central uh, theme that I'm interested in, in here is that I think if we want to ascribe agency or purpose, or teleonomy, to the organism, you do need to take the presence of within organism conflict uh, seriously. I think the genes I view uh, at its best is good at highlighting this kind of um, topic, uh, especially because it shows that the kind of genomic unity of purpose needed for organism agency cannot be taken for granted. It is there and it needs to be explained. That is not to say that is, that is the only way to approach it. I think perspectives like multi-level selection and so on has a lot to offer uh, uh, this uh, general uh, argument uh, as well. Um, I think the, the interesting thing though for me is if, if we're interested in kind of the history of these ideas is that the individual as a maximizing agent and that tradition within evolutionary theory can be extended to apply to the level uh, of the gene as well. And I think to, to me, this, this, there's an interesting question of, can this help us then make sense of the, the paradox of the organism? And finally, uh, I do think that genomic conflict is not interesting simply because they, I think, are fundamental to understanding the basic principle of uh, agency and teleonomy, but also because the history of this field provides an interesting case study or window into the, the disagreements uh, over the, the value of these kinds of uh, ideas. Um, with that, I would like to thank a, a very large number of people. This, this is basically the, the first half of this talk very much stems from uh, the book that I've written. I've been very um, taken by the generosity of uh, colleagues, uh, many that I knew, many that I did not. Um, I would also like to thank the, the Vennegren Foundations for the uh, continued uh, financial uh, support. Uh, and um, with that, I'm uh, happy to, uh, I'm very excited for the rest of the conference and uh, learning from uh, all of you. Thank you. Dick, shall we take a break?
Okay, I think a uh, five minute break and then we can start the next talk. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Arvid, very much for that extremely interesting talk. Uh, as uh, Padma says, we'll take a, a, a few moments break and start the next uh, uh, talk on the hour. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. Um, uh, we're about to start the meeting again with our next talk, uh, which will be a presentation by uh, Professor Bernard Crespi of Simon University, uh, Simon Fraser University. Um, just to remind you, as I think Padma has already done by the chat function, 
that all the questions should be saved. Please do make a note if you have questions for presenters uh, for this session at the, the last session at the end of tomorrow. We're not taking questions live during the meeting and we're not filling any little gaps like the one we just had. Uh, use those to give a little bit of relief in what is a very dense program. So uh, are you ready there somewhere, uh, Padma? I'm ready. Thank you. So the next talk, Bernard's talk, uh, which has been pre-recorded, is entitled Three Laws of Teleonometrics. So over to you, Padma, to press the button. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bernie Crespi from Simon Fraser University. I'll be speaking today about three laws of teleonometrics, the empirical analysis of teleonomy. I first wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this meeting. Thank you, Peter and Dick. And I also wanted to thank George Williams shown here for inspiring my interest in adaptation and teleonomy. I'm going to be addressing three questions today. First, how do goal-directed functions differ across hierarchical biological levels? Second, how does goal-directed function work under trade-offs in pleiotropy? And third, how does goal-directed function evolve with regard to minor and major transitions across evolutionary time. The first law of tele teleonometrics says that teleonomic functions exhibit hierarchical organization across biological levels from individuals at the top to phenotypes in the middle to genes at the bottom. And most importantly, the number of goal-directed functions increases from individuals to inter intermediate levels to genes and alleles. So as shown here in the table, individuals maximize inclusive fitness. They have a single goal-directed function. Phenotypes from body parts to development, their goal-directed function involves optimization across several to a moderate number of different functions. And at the bottom, genes and alleles optimize many, many context-dependent goals. There are complications at each of these levels, intragenomic conflicts at the level of individuals, trade-offs at the level of phenotypes and trade-offs and pleiotropy at the level of genes and alleles. I want to talk first about maximizing inclusive fitness. As originally described by William Hamilton, inclusive fitness includes fitness via descendant kin and fitness via effects on collateral kin as shown in this equation. So the essence of inclusive fitness is that we have a trait in ego, that's you, that's me shown here. And a trait in ego evolves in function to maximize the number of copies of ego's alleles underlying the trait that are projected into future generations. So we need to think of ourselves as an allele here and look at the world as the number of probabilistic copies of that allele in other individuals, and then the costs and benefits of certain behaviors towards those individuals. What is special about inclusive fitness is that it is not subject to trade-offs. It is what is maximized by evolution. Now, inclusive fitness is not so simple because individuals are not simply like pedigrees. Individuals are comprised of genetic agents with different inheritance patterns and as a result, conflicting goals and functions. And this is essentially 
intragenomic conflict that can involve chromosomes, can involve genomic imprinting, can involve cytoplasmic agents inherited only through the maternal line and nuclear agents that are biparental, can involve meiotic drive, can involve transposons. And in the context of intragenomic conflict, we need to think a little more carefully about what a genome is. And I've tried to define a genome, an evolutionary genome, as a set of cooperating genetic agents. So the evolutionary genome codes for producing a functional vehicle of selection, a goal-directed vehicle of selection, suite of favorable phenotypes to the extent that its different genetic elements cooperate. So it's a little bit fuzzy, like the evolutionary definition of a gene. Intragenomic conflicts degrade goal-directed functions of the individual. They're anti-functional, anti-teleonomy, as it were. This can be the result of one party winning, another party losing. The individual loses fitness as a result. Wasteful tugs of war, new and more scope for maladaptive dysregulation, and the evolution of mechanisms to suppress conflict can come about as a result of these fitness reductions. So this is a, a positive outcome, the suppression of conflict, which can be quite important on macroevolutionary scales. So here's a little example of intragenomic conflict where we have two agents that might be inherited in different ways, say cytoplasmic and nuclear. They're both pushing towards their optimum. We have selection for escalation of the pushing. We have some, say, loss of function in one agent causing the other agent to push too far, and you end up with maladaptation uh, in both, being away from the optimum of both parties and from the individual. The main importance of the first law is that the ultimate goal-directed function cross levels is maximizing inclusive fitness, the level of the individuals. All other functions at all other levels subserve this goal and are subject to various forms of trade-offs. And curiously in humans, from work by Richard Alexander, knowledge of this maximizing inclusive fitness goal apparently interferes with achieving it. We want other people to think that we are altruistic, and do not just think about maximizing our own inclusive fitness. However, natural selection selects for us to engage in the behaviors that do maximize inclusive fitness. The second law of teleonometrics states that the function of functions of alleles, genes, and traits are described by patterns of trade-offs and pleiotropy. Trade-offs and pleiotropy constrain adaptation and global optimization, but they can be alleviated, reduced, or broken by several mechanisms. And the two main mechanisms here are more resources, which decrease the strength of the trade-off and the constraints, and divisions of labor, which essentially break the trade-off and increase efficiencies. Main implications of the second law are that traits are not really traits in a conventional sense of the word, but traits are trade-offs between functions. And to understand them, we need to know what those trade-offs are. And at the level of genes, genes don't have particular functions. Genes have sets of functions which are defined by patterns of pleiotropy. So the idea here is that we need to take a different view of what traits actually are and what genes actually are and what they do 
in the context of goal-directed function. So to take one of the classic examples from evolutionary biology, we all know that the Galapagos were colonized by a group of finches that diversified and speciated and evolved to a set of species that feed on different sorts of foods. And as a result, have different forms of bills, which are adapted to the type of food upon which they feed. And this, this lovely slide epitomizes the, the, the functional design of the bills by showing how these, these different bills can be equated in function to particular kinds of pliers that you can get at the hardware store. So the conventional view then, beaks are tools with specific goal-directed functions in efficiently acquiring food. Now, is it so simple? Some relatively recent work shows that beaks are not just tools for getting food, they're also tools for attracting mates. Birds with larger beaks tend to produce songs with different properties compared to birds with smaller beaks. So the beaks are not just tools, the beaks are also musical instruments. And we expect, although no one has looked for yet, we expect there to be certain forms of trade-offs between these rather different functions. More generally, what do hormones, proteins, and genes do? Do they each have a function? Well, I would say under the second law, they do not. I would say that they mediate trade-offs, and so would Steve Stearns, the, the parent, as it were, of life history theory. By trade-offs, I mean balances between beneficial but incompatible states. So to give an example of the major trade-offs across life histories. You can have trade-offs between growth and maintenance and reproduction, and how much goes into each of these functions will define a particular life history of a species or of an individual. So the question then becomes, how does natural selection alleviate or break or reduce trade-offs because there will always be selection to do so, to try to overcome them. And there's two main ways. First is acquiring overall resources, more resources that will reduce the constraints. And this is the issue of the car house paradox. Why do people who have a fancy house drive a fancy car if there's trade-offs between spending money on a car and house, well, it's the rich people who have the fancy car and house, and they are less subject to trade-offs than uh, people who do not. And second, new or sharper division of labor. So taking one function as essentially dividing it into two functions, each of which can be uh, separately uh, optimized instead of each having to be having to be subject to compromise. Hormones do not have particular functions. Instead, they mediate life history trade-offs. For example, in males, trade-offs between reproductive effort and survivorship are mediated by testosterone. In women, trade-off between present and future reproductive effort are mediated for example, by progesterone and estradiol. Alleles also mediate trade-offs. Proteins are phenotypes in the same way that the beaks of finches are phenotypes. Just a few examples. Gene COM-T has a polymorphism that affects levels of dopamine. If you have the VAL allele, you have better cognitive flexibility, but worse stability. If you have the MET allele, you have the, work, the opposite 
there is a very clear cognitive trade-off that affects aspects of personality and risk of psychiatric disorders. Apolipoprotein E, the E4 allele compared to E3 and E2. If you have E4, you have better verbal and memory skills, especially when you're young, but notably increased risk of neurodegenerative and other aging related disorders. And finally, TP53, tumor suppressor gene, the guardian of the genome at codon 72. If you have more proline, you have reduced reproduction, but higher survival. If you have more arginine, you have the reverse. One of my favorite examples of pleiotropy involving a particular gene comes from the MC1R gene, the melanoc melanocortin-1 receptor gene. And this is the gene that is uh, responsible for the phenotypes of former Prince Harry. In particular, people with particular loss of function alleles of this gene have pale skin, red hair, and eyes that are green or blue. MC1R, however, influences a wide range of other sorts of traits, including pain sensitivity only in women, inflammation, and endometriosis. And through the set of phenotypes that it influences, variation in MC1R affects risk of melanoma, risk of Parkinson's, risk of endometriosis, and risk of bipolar disorder. These four diseases, these four forms of uh, antifunction, if you will, are all positively associated and comorbid in part because of their joint dependence on variation in the gene MC1R. Now, what about polygenic traits? Most traits are, are polygenic. They're influenced by many genes of small effect. This is some results from a genome-wide association study, a GWAS. Here's many, many genes on the X across a set of chromosomes, and the sizes of their the sizes of these effects is shown by these little points. So the ones up high are having a more substantial effect on the variation in the phenotype. So quantitative traits are underlined by many alleles, each of small effect, and the question then becomes, well, what exactly do we mean by many? The polygenic model has recently been replaced by the so-called omnigenic model. And under this model, there may or may not be a small set of core genes affecting a trait, but most of the variation in the trait is affected by a huge set, thousands of genes, perhaps the entire genome, each with relatively small effects on variation in the trait. So under the omnigenic model, pleiotropy is absolutely pervasive and universal. And we should think of the effects of a gene not as a function, but almost as the opposite. That is a huge set of pleiotropic functions that need to be elucidated and defined to actually understand what the gene does. One of the best ways to understand and analyze pleiotropy is with something called a FIWAS analysis. It's kind of the opposite of GWAS. With GWAS, we have a trait and we want to look at the set of loci, the set of genes that influence the trait. With a FIWAS, we are looking at a particular gene or a particular locus like MC1R, and we're looking to see what is the set of phenotypes that are associated with that. So FIWAS provides a quantification of pleiotropy. And if you do, if I do a FIWAS analysis of the MC1R gene, 
what I find is a set of traits, all of which so show highly statistically significant associations with the gene, including the former Prince Harry traits, hair color, ease of tanning, skin color, variety of other traits, reticulocyte count, bone mineral density, standing height, age at menopause, a, a trait that we find in uh, the true prince, William, male pattern baldness also associated with this gene, and then a whole set of other traits on and on. And it, it's this set of traits that defines at the trait level the patterns of pleiotropy that define what the gene or what the allele does. So what we're looking at is a large network of positive and negative pleiotropic effects across time, across cells, and across tissues. So pleiotropy has a shape, and we can get a little bit of a picture of the shape here for the MC1R gene. This is a simplified pathway underlying the pleiotropy for this set of traits. We have dopamine involved in bipolar disorder, two forms of melanin involved in melanoma here, and neuromelanin involved in uh, Parkinson's. So this is basically the, the pathway that's intermediate between that big set of functions and then the phenotypes uh, that we observe. A final example of pleiotropy a recent remarkable finding was strong evidence of positive pleiotropy between autism genetic risk and genes for high intelligence. So there's broad overlap between alleles for autism and alleles for intelligence. There are many alleles that increase intelligence and increase risk of autism. And this is paradoxical because we usually think that people with autism will have reduced intelligence. So it's, it's a paradox what is going on. We conducted a study to try to figure out why we find these patterns of positive pleiotropy and what Underly, underlies the pattern, we asked, what do these positively pleiotropy, positive pleiotropy genes do? To do that, we coll collated the GWAS results for autism intelligence and educational attainment, and we divided them up into genes that show positive pleiotropy, increase intelligence or educational attainment, increase autism risk, and negative pleiotropy, increase in one but not the other. We use something called gene ontology analysis to compare the gene functions for the genes that we found for A versus B. And gene ontology is a formal representation of knowledge of gene functions. It essentially gives you a list of all of the known functions of a gene from the research that's been conducted on that gene in the literature. So here are some of our results. These are the results for positive pleiotropy gene for intelligence and autism risk. This is essentially the shape of the pleiotropy from the gene ontology analysis. There is an enrichment of genes. That is, there are more genes than expected by chance with particular functions that contribute to higher intelligence and autism risk. And those functions are RNA splicing and neuronal development and differentiation. These are the genes that appear to underlie both autism risk and high intelligence. By contrast, there are no enrichments whatsoever for negatively pleiotropic genes. If we look at educational attainment and autism risk, we have similar results here, enrichments for neuronal development, neuronal migration, and neuronal differentiation for the positive pleiotropy gene, and no enrichments at all for the negatively pleiotropic genes. 
what does this mean? What do these pleiotrope, positive pleiotropy genes do? Apparently they are involved in RNA splicing and neuronal gene regulation. And in order to understand the functional basis of, the, of these findings, one needs to look at the roles of RNA splicing and neuronal gene regulation in both intelligence and autism risk. And this should, in theory, lead to insights into both of these sorts of traits. The third law of teleonometrics has to do with the major transitions in evolution, as described by John Maynard Smith and E.O. Sathmary. We all know about minor transitions in evolution. They're driven by quantitative shifts in adaptive teleonomic functional goals. They're largely, de largely deterministic and predictable. Some traits like the beaks of Darwin's finches, you get selection on beak size or shape that may be directional and you evolve a bigger beak or a beak of a different shape, conventional evolutionary short-term change. However, under the third law, the major transitions in evolution are driven by qualitative shifts involving the origins of novel emergent adaptive functions. And these shifts tend to involve enhancements of resources and divisions of labor and new forms of cooperation. They also involve a considerable degree of chance and goallessness or serendipity to get going. And here are some of these major transitions in evolution. And most of these seem to involve the breaking of major trade-offs through enhancements of resources by getting larger divisions of labor by evolving new functions and forms of cooperation, as well as forms that of uh, adaptation that repress intragenomic conflict. Today I've presented three so-called laws of teleonometrics. First law, how, do, how does goal-directed function differ across hierarchical levels? I have argued that at the highest level of inclusive fitness, there is a single unique teleonomic function maximizing inclusive fitness, and there's no trade-offs there. The lowest level, many, many functions, many, many trade-offs, intermediate levels uh, in between. In this context, the genome is the set of genes that collectively code for a cooperating vehicle of selection. Second, how does goal-directed function work under trade-offs in pleiotropy? Here, we need to change our view about traits and genes. Here, the trade-off is the trait, the function is the trade-off, and the gene function is the pleiotropy. Trade-offs are fundamental, but they can be broken or alleviated, usually by the acquisition of more resources or by divisions of labor. And third, how does goal-directed function evolve with regard to major, minor and major transitions? Major transitions appear to involve qualitative shifts in function that often increase resources and generate new divisions of labor, both of which can break major trade-offs. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Hello. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bernie, for, for the last talk, um, which was recorded. Uh, we have a few moments now before we start on the, exactly on the half hour with our next speaker. Uh, just to remind you to keep your questions, keep a note of your questions, if you have any, uh, for the last session. I'm also already wondering 
with respect to our last two speakers about the role of the holobiont in the question of what is an individual, uh, because I think that's also a further level which is yet to be addressed in this in this conference. And if not, if it's not addressed, it's something we will need to think about, I, I suspect, in the follow up. Anyway, uh, I think we are pretty much at the half hour. So I'm going to call on our next speaker from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. And that's Dr. Dominic Defner. Dominic's talk is entitled Constructing on Purpose, How Niche Construction Affects Natural Selection. So uh, over to you, Dominic, you have 29 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the very nice introduction. Can you hear me? Is it is everything fine? You can see it, okay. Um, so thanks for calling me a doctor already. I'm actually defending my dissertation on Friday. So I think that will be a good sign. Um, so I'm Dominic Defner. I'm currently working as a postdoc at the MPI for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. And I'm working on questions of cultural evolution, social learning, and the co-evolution of culture and demography. So mostly in humans. Uh, but what I'm presenting today is mostly work I've been doing with um, Professor Kevin Leyland at the University of St. Andrews. Um, so my talk is entitled Constructing on Purpose, How Niche Construction Affects Natural Selection. I will start with a um, quite general overview about niche construction theory and the role of niche construction in evolution. And then in the end, um, in the second half of the talk, I will talk about the project we've been doing where we try to quantify the effect of niche construction on natural selection in the wild by measuring the strength and variability of natural selection. Niche construction theory um, is nicely encapsulated in this quote, so the organism influences its own evolution by being both the object of natural selection and the creator of the conditions of that selection. So what the niche construction perspective uh, offers is a bi-directional view of evolution. So adaptation does not simply arise from an external environment acting um, on gene frequencies. Uh, so not um, only the external environment acting on the organism, but the organism also modifying the conditions of that selection. So as an example, you can see here a leaf tie um, made by the larvae of a leaf tying moth. So these uh, adult moths, they lay their eggs uh, on leaves. Um, the larvae then feed off some, of some small plant parts. Um, and then they use their silk to create those leaf ties in, in order to um, have a nice uh, microenvironment that is suitable to their needs. So uh, research has shown that inside of uh, these leaf ties, um, there is lower temperature, higher humidity. So, so these organisms uh, are not only subject to external forces of the environment, but they're also co-creators of their own environment and not in random ways, but in ways that are suitable um, to their uh, survival and reproduction. And so formally, uh, niche construction has been defined using those three criteria. So the first criterion says an organism, this is a candidate niche constructor, must significantly modify environmental conditions. So that's just the environmental modification part. There must be some work done on the environment. Uh, the second criterion says that the organism-mediated environmental modification must in turn influence selection pressures on the recipient of niche construction. So that's the niche construction part. It's not just about modifying the environment per se, but it's modifying the selective niche of an organism. It's, elect it's modifying the environment in a way that affects selection on a trade. And those two criteria constitute niche construction. Um, but then for evolution by niche construction, we also need the criterion three, which says that there must be a detectable evolutionary response in a recipient of niche construction that is caused by the environmental modification of the niche constructor. Different categories of niche construction have been defined. So classically, we have those four categories where you can differentiate between inceptive niche construction and contractive niche construction and perturbational and relocational niche construction. In inceptive niche construction, an organism initiates a change in the selective environment. So it creates new conditions. You can think of 
um, urban environments that are created by humans, uh, things that are just in evolutionary terms novel. A counteractive niche construction, on the other hand, um, is niche construction that counteracts a prior change in the environment. So that's inherently conservative. It's about maintaining um, certain environmental parameters within a range that's suitable to an organism. And we will uh, focus on, on the latter type here. But there is also the um, distinction between perturbation and relocation. Perturbation refers to physical alterations in the environment. So birds building nests, uh, the beaver dam, and so on. And, and, and that's what comes to mind to most people when they hear niche construction. So it's a physical alteration in the environment. But um, niche construction is not only the physical modification of the environment, it's, just, it's the modification of the niche of an organism. So it also um, refers to relocational niche construction where organisms uh, choose a suitable habitat um, or just move in space. And some other researchers have also proposed a fifth type of niche construction called experiential niche construction, where there is no change at all in the environment and also no movement, but the organism changes um, their experience of the environment. But I won't go into detail here. Niche construction, of course, is a very old idea. Um, already Charles Darwin, in the year before his death, um, published this book, The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, with observation on their habits. In this book, Darwin observed how, how um, biological material is decomposed by worms and how worms um, affect the microhabitat. So how would they transform the soil? Um, on a rather theoretical basis, Evan Schrödinger, um, in his famous essay, What is Life?, um, described niche construction as a universal feature of life. So according to Schrödinger, um, living organisms are far from equilibrium systems. And uh, it, just in order to survive, in order to maintain their boundaries, they need to do active work on the environment. So that means they need to niche construct. Also, Conrad Weddington um, had ideas that are very, very similar to a modern niche construction perspective. So here you can see the passage from the genotypes of generation N to genotypes of the uh, generation N plus one. And he postulated that um, on top of the genetic system where um, mutation modifies um, gene frequencies and a natural selective system where environments um, select for different um, reactions, there must also be an epigenetic system, which basically describes how different environmental niches uh, um, reveal certain potentialities, um, as he calls it, which just means that um, it's basically the reaction norm. So different um, phenotypes are expressed depending on environmental conditions. But he also postulated this exploitative system where animals choose among possible environments and then also modify environments. And this active role of um, animals then modifies the environmental niche, which, um, which changes development and also natural selection. Later on, there's been a lot of theoretical modeling work. Um, so Kevin Leyland with Marcus Feldman, um, they developed those uh, two locus uh, population genetic models where they modeled the co-evolution of a niche constructor trait and a recipient trait, and then investigated how um, these dynamics would change when um, organisms would um, permanently modify parameters in the environment. So how those niche construction models would differ from, from, from classic um, co-evolutionary models. And then um, in 2003, they published this book with a Chana Links Me, who, who actually coined the term niche construction in a 1988 paper. Um, and with this paper, the niche construction perspective really took, um, uh, took off in evolutionary biology. And now, of course, niche construction theory is also a big part of the so-called extended evolutionary synthesis. So in, so in this graph, um, you can see two different um, views on development. So, so in the classical program development view, um, there's just inheritance of the genome, and then uh, causality flows just from the genome to the organism, to the environment, where, where inheritance only occurs through genes and nothing else. 
And then in the constructed um, development view on the bottom, you can see that there is bi-directional causation uh, between organism, environment, and the genome, and also inheritance occurs on multiple levels. So there's genetic inheritance that can also be epigenetic inheritance, and, and even environmental modifications can be inherited, as you will see later. Of course, a lot of the things that niche construction theory talks about has been discussed long by, by evolutionary uh, biologists. So, um, of course, Richard Dawkins with this extended phenotype a concept um, it covers a lot of the same phenomenon that niche construction covers. Uh, the extended phenotype is simply a phenotype um, that's expressed outside of the organism. So the beaver's dam evolved because it served uh, the fitness goals of the beaver. Um, and, and Richard Dawkins um, argued that, um, that there is nothing special about these environmental modification phenotypes um, that would need to, um, th uh, that would force us to, to include niche construction as a separate process. But there are indeed certain features of niche construction that are um, additional to simple extended phenotypes views. Um, so first, niche construction can generate ecological legacy, as I said before. So um, the effects of niche construction behavior um, are not only sensible to the organism who, who did the construction in the first place, but the environmental modifications persist or can persist the lifetime of the original niche construction and thereby influence selection for, for later generations. So, for example, uh, we now live in the Anthropocene, um, which is the prime example of ecological um, legacy. So people who changed environmental parameters long ago uh, still affect selection pressures today. Um, and second niche construction arises also from acquired characteristics. And those um, modifications can, can also modify patterns of natural selection. So most famously, there is niche, uh, there's gene culture coevolution in humans. On the right, you can see um, a map of lactose and persistence. And researchers have shown that the prevalence of lactose intolerance uh, today can be traced back to, to the exposure um, to dairy farming that go back millennia. So um, there is a cultural innovation at dairy farming which um, exposes individuals uh, to milk, and that creates uh, selection pressures for organisms um, to remain lactose uh, tolerant even in adulthood. So now there's been a lot of evidence also for gene culture coevolution in other animals, for example, in whales and, and dolphins, where, um, where socially learned feeding traditions can lead to reproductive isolation, and so it's um, to different uh, speciation events. Many have postulated niche construction as an evolutionary process. And of course, there is a question, what counts as an evolutionary process? Uh, traditionally, in models of quantitative and population genetics, only processes that could directly change gene frequencies are um, regarded as evolutionary processes, because of course, evolution is regarded as a change in, um, in gene frequencies over time. And niche construction can directly change gene frequencies. For example, um, if there is a very strong um, a prey choice that directly changes uh, gene frequencies. But um, probably more importantly, niche construction can indirectly change gene frequencies through modifying environmental conditions and thereby indirectly influencing selection. And that's the function that I wanna talk about here. So um, niche construction is an evolutionary bias that systematically changes natural selection pressures, whereby organisms can co-direct their own evolutionary pathway uh, through modifying patterns of selection. And it's useful here um, uh, to think of niche construction in analogy to natural versus artificial selection. So if we have natural selection, um, environmental influences are, are quite unpredictable uh, to an organism. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there are environmental fluctuations, uh, temperatures change, um, and there is no way to really predict long-term outcomes of evolution. Under artificial selection, on the other hand, um, there is someone who explicitly selects individuals for reproduction. So there is a very 
a clear goal in mind. And that has the consequence that we can very easily predict how, how traits will change over time because a selection is artificially imposed um, externally. And niche construction uh, can be thought of as occupying the middle ground. So whereas an organism never has complete control about environmental parameters, each construction should lead to some sort of consistency in selection pressures because organisms um, change the environment in a way that's non-random because um, it, it depends on traits that have been subjected to, um, to previous selection. And the logic is illustrated here. So, so you can see um, two different pathways how changes in the environment can occur. At first, there are autonomous environmental processes, uh, by which we mean all processes uh, that are not under the direct control of an organism. And then there are also niche construction activities. And niche construction activities then lead to changes in the environment that change selective environments, modify gene frequencies, and can lead to, to uh, changed phenotypic plasticity, changed um, a genetic basis of behavior, and so on. And importantly, um, these changes in the environment are part of a feedback loop that starts with the organism and then uh, goes through the environment and affects the organism again. And because of this um, feedback loop, we can expect that there are different properties of changes in the environment that derive from, from these construction activities as opposed to uh, autonomous environmental processes. So we predicted that niche construction generates selection pressures that are reliable, directed, orderly, and often highly consistent across diverse organisms, which should lead to less variation in selection, but also to weaker selection. I tested this hypothesis with my co-authors, uh, Andy Clark, um, Kami Leila, John Otling smee and John Andrew, and the resulting paper has been published early last year in the American Naturalist. We went to the literature and we looked at appropriate data sources. So starting in the 1980s, um, theoretical foundations have been laid by, by John Endler and of course by Russell um, Lande and Stephen Arnold. Um, and we specifically focused on, on selection gradients. So, se so selection gradients are simply um, the, regress uh, the regression coefficients. If you regress relative fitness on, um, on different standardized uh, phenotypes. So it basically describes how strongly relative fitness changes with changes in, um, in the standardized, uh, standardized phenotype. And importantly, it, um, it accounts for, uh, for correlated traits by including them all in a single regression model. And so through the development of standardized selection gradients, there was a common metric um, that could be used by different researchers to quantify selection in many different uh, domains. So, um, um, yeah, so basically by, uh, um, uh, through the introduction of selection gradients, it was possible uh, to conduct meta-analyses of a selection in the wild by providing a common footing for different studies. Um, so you can see here on the left there, um, is a long-term study by Grant and Grant where they observed changes in in quantitative uh, uh, traits and Darwin finches, but there are now a lot of these studies out there with um, data spanning uh, 30 to 40 years, which is a very unique uh, source. So we took all these studies out of the literature and then we categorized them depending on whether they were subject to niche construction or not. And so um, I want to reiterate here that it's not about the evolution of niche construction per se, but about niche construction as a source of selection. So how traits in an organism or in other organisms respond to constructed versus non-constructed sources of selection. And so for each trait, we ask two questions. So first, is there a clear and strong signal of regulatory niche construction? So we focused only on counteractive niche construction. If no, we categorize the trait as non-constructed. If yes, we ask the second question. Is there also a clear and strong influence of autonomous environmental influences? Because of course, an organism um, cannot always completely control environmental parameters. So um, in case no, if there is only a clear signal of niche construction, we, ca we categorize this trait as constructed. And if not, we, can, we categorize it as mixed. So here's just some examples. 
Uh, so pupil mass in this um, leaf tying moth was categorized as constructed uh, because um, the major parameters uh, that affect pupil mass um, are under the control of the niche constructor in the leaf tie. Whereas a fledgling um, wingspan in, in tilts was categorized as mixed because of course the nest imposed very strong uh, constraints on selection on the wingspan, but of course it was also dependent on a lot of other processes like, like temperature and, and especially food availability. And we constructed laying date, for instance, as non-constructed because it's known that that's highly uh, dependent on temperature and other climatic variables. So with this in mind, uh, we arrived at our final data set that comprised a total of 1,230 selection gradients that were um, divided into non-constructed, constructed, and mixed sources of selection. And we often investigated um, a combined and constructed sources uh, together, and we just call that a combined, uh, just to have a bigger sample size. And so what we were interested in is um, the temporal or spatial variation of selection gradients within the same study system. So we categorized all our data into different subsets. And subsets just describe a selection gradients within the same species, with the same trait, with the same fitness measure, but from different years or from different locations. But here I just focus on the year. Um, so for example, in subset one, we have those uh, six different selection gradients um, that come from the years uh, 91 to 96. And, and you can, um, and we plotted them down there um, with the mean indicated by the red bar. And so the total variation in selection gradients uh, can be uh, decomposed into between subset variation. So that would be the variation um, among the means in each subset and within subset variation, which is variation in selection within the same system um, across different years. And that's what we were really interested in because that's, yeah, that's a temporal or spatial variation. But to estimate this quantity, we derived the Bayesian random effects meta-analytic models. So the selection gradient estimate I for the chase subset in the kth niche construction category um, was composed of an average gradient for the category K, so for example, for constructed or non-constructed by random uh, offsets for each subset. Um, then uh, by uh, a deviation due to sampling error, which is very important to incorporate because otherwise you would greatly overestimate variation uh, just due to sampling variation. And then importantly, by the residual variation, which is every variation that's left after you account for all the other stuff. And so that's often just recorded as error in many other models. But in our model, uh, this is our target of inference. This is the temporal or spatial variation. So all results presented here are posterior distributions, which just describe the plausible parameter values conditional on the data and the model. And we can see that um, a combined a cases, so cases where we have um, a strong signal of selection show substantially lower temporal variation in selection. And, and this is also still true if we differentiate between mixed and purely constructed cases. We can then express the same data in terms of the expected difference between um, random years. And we can still see that there is um, much lower temporal variation. Um, so in this case, there are smaller expected differences between years if there is a strong signal of niche construction. And then we also calculated consistency, which relates the within uh, to the subs um, to the uh, to the within to the between subset variation. And here the results are less clear cut, but at least for for the mixed uh, traits, we can see a higher consistency in in selection. And what's very cool is that um, at this effect, it didn't depend on whether we looked at um, physical artifacts or choice, whether we looked at self-constructed or other constructed cases, or whether we can, uh, looked at a niche construction through a single species or through multiple related species. So the effect was very robust. And then after that, we also uh, conducted a more sophisticated double hierarchical model just to be sure that the results are robust. And, and also here, we can find substantially lower temporal variation. 
Then we did all sort of robustness, che uh, robustness checks. We, we checked results in birds or in species excluding birds um, in studies that um, reported both constructed and non-constructed cases. And overall, we found very strong evidence uh, that niche construction reduces temporal variation in the wild. Dominic, Dominic yes? you have, you've got four minutes left, please. Oh, cool. Uh, the next, we look at spatial variation, where we find a similar effect. So we have um, a smaller spatial variation with niche construction, but the effects are less clear cut just because the sample sizes is much, um, are much smaller. Lastly, we also looked at the strength of selection, and we used this random effects meta-analysis and then took the mean absolute value as expectation of the folded normal distribution. And this was necessary because we were only interested in the strength of selection, um, irrespective of the science. And also here, we can see that um, a combined cases um, resulted in weaker a selection than the non-constructed cases, um, which is especially true for the purely constructed cases where you can see, um, which you can see in green. So if there is, only a very strong signal of niche construction. Uh, this led to a very um, weak selection. And this effect was even stronger when we removed phenological traits because there was usually very weak um, selection on phenological traits and there was an excess of phenological uh, traits among the non-constructed categories. So that might have confounded our analysis. So to sum up, regulatory um, or counteractive niche construction substantially reduces temporal variation in, se in selection. It likely reduces spatial variation in selection, but we need more data for that. And it lowers the mean magnitude of selection. So niche construction imposes a statistical bias on natural selection. But to learn more, you can check out our paper, or you can also go at the new niche construction website, where you can um, find a lot of resources um, on, on niche construction theory, the implications for different fields, and so on. So, so thanks very much for the invitation, and thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much, Dominic, uh, for a summary of a remarkable series of, uh, uh, of, of researches. It's extremely interesting. Um, OK, so we have two or three minutes before we need to move on to our next talk, and we'll take a little space. but. I wonder if uh, Padma can update me uh, and Simon uh, regarding whether uh, Tony Truavas is available or not. Yes, we're all good. Thanks. We're all good to go. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take a couple of minutes and we'll start on the, on the hour uh, with our next talk, which is about plants, which uh, is uh, very important, I think, to, ha ha to realize that uh, Plants also uh, are subject to uh, teleonomic uh, selection. Teleonomy is important in plants too, because I think quite a lot of people imagine, because so much of it is to do with behavior, that these factors in evolution can only apply to animals. But I don't think that's the case. And I think uh, most of our presenters don't believe that that's the case. Anyway, plants in a couple of minutes. Thank you.
Okay, well, I make it uh, three o'clock local time here in uh, the UK. So time to start our next presentation, which is a double act. And it's about plants, as I mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, Professor Simon Gilroy of Wisconsin and uh, Professor Emeritus Anthony Travavis in Edinburgh will speak to their title, Signal Transduction, Decision-Making and Agency in Plant Systems. And I think, Anthony, you will be speaking first. Thank you. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Dick, Frank, thank you for the introduction. I hope you can see the slide that I put up. Yes. Uh, I'm getting beyond me this electronic uh, way of communicating, but... Tony, uh, you're muted. Uh, muted yourself by mistake. Can you unmute yourself, please? Muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Right, okay, I thought I had done that. Please move this window away from the shared application. If you can do that, I don't know why it's come up. Um, anyway, agency teleonomy and signal transduction in plant systems. Uh, that's the name of the paper we will submit. And the consequence of that uh, is that um, I'm going to very quickly and at great speed go through some of the things that are actually in the paper. Uh, Simon will cut in after about 15 minutes. Uh, when I finish going through those, you should uh, realize that this will all be recorded anyway. And uh, as a consequence, um, you should be able to go through it at your own speed and your own leisure. Let me go through and say something about uh, about plants itself. There's going to be four slides by way of simple introduction. Earth is a planet dominated by plants. That is self-evident. They are the basis of all food chains. The predation is inevitable and therefore the evolution of highly specialized tissues such as lidney, liver, kidney, brain, heart, for example, would be disastrous. The evolutionary solution to this was to put growth and identify it in what are called meristems. These are embryogenic, embryogenic areas. Uh, you find them in the shoot with numerous buds, which are located down here like that. And there's another uh, meristems down in the lateral roots, which would grow there. The simple idea behind this, lose some, there are plenty of others which you can actually get to recover the plant. Plants have a habit of leaving stem cells all over themselves, uh, so they in fact regenerate extremely easily. There's a fundamental issue here, uh, which I indicate at the bottom. We ourselves are animals and have expectations of movement within our time frame to judge plant behavior. Visible plant behavior is usually changes in development. It's much slower and very different but it does give rise to the idea that plants don't do anything. I'm going to show you two short videos here to indicate that apparently they do do something. Uh, this one shows uh, a dodder seedling. Dodder is a predatory plant that lives off what it can gain out of other plants. And this one takes about a day in total, but you can see that in fact this uh, Dodger seedling is beginning to find that there are volatiles being emitted by this plant and it's going to home in on those volatiles in due course. And once it's attached to it, it can start to get the resources that it needs. There's another one here I want to show you about choice and decision uh, in Dodder. Um, this one, you're giving it a choice between the tomato plant and the maize plant, and already you'll see that the dodder has, in fact, a preference for the tomato plant. 90% of the time, it'll always identify that tomato as the one it wishes to uh, predate. 10% of the time, it'll take the maize plant, and if the tomato plant is not there, it'll quite happily take the maize. Plant awareness. They are aware of all major physical and chemical influences of the environment. 
and respond to these to improve survival. There is competition for all resources and there's cooperation on disease and pests in the wild. They are proprioceptive. Let me emphasize that. They can understand their position in space. And that's an important quality, nicely demonstrated by Bruno Mullier um, over many years of work. Visible behavior is the plasticity of the phenotype resulting from changes in development, not as in animals. Pests, the only things I'm going to say about pests here, important though they are in plant biology, plants can sense the frequency of caterpillar jaw chewing. They can distinguish the kind of pests from salivary juice chemistry that's attacking them, and they can detect the mating pheromones of the pest. Sensing any of these initiates production of volatiles, such as methyl jasmonate, that in turn initiate defense reactions, such as natural pesticide synthesis. The most familiar to everyone is nicotine. But there are 100,000 of these, and many of them flavor the food that you enjoy eating as well. And you do eat several hundred every day. Volatiles inform others close by who prepare defense. Internal communication, 10 hormones, and an unknown number of sRNAs, proteins, mRNAs, oligosaccharides circulate and act like hormones. All known signals alter behavior, influence intracellular calcium, and Simon will say more of that in due course. Agency. In real world circumstances, individual growing plants perceive their environment, make decisions on what they perceive, change their development and thus phenotype, which in turn alters their environment, thus changing future perception, changing their development and their phenotype. Selection operates on that combination of changing environment, changing phenotype, which acts together in a complex dynamic. It is Lewington's construction theory, which we're putting down here. When I put it in a diagram for you, the agency view shows an information cycle going round and round in that particular way. Um, whatever the plant is doing changes the environment, environment is changed, and this influences the plant itself back again in this cycle of events. The traditional view is the environment influences a plant, full stop, and nothing more is actually said. There are seven aspects to agency in plants that we deal with in the paper. The first of these is making a path by walking. That's a statement by Francesco Varela that very aptly summarizes what happens when roots penetrate the soil. They secrete enzymes, sugars, amino acids, secondary products, mucilage, organic acid, all of which attract soil bacteria to them. And they also secrete strigalactone that attracts mycorrhizae that forms a hyphal web connecting adjacent plants. You'll see that very nicely in this picture here, uh, which I've got, in which these two plants are connected through this hyphal web in this way. These are both pine seedlings, so this is what's called an ectomycorrhizal arrangement here. The mycorrhizal form a sheath around the root, and through that sheath there is a symbiotic mycorrhizal network that provides calcium, iron and phosphate to the root, and in turn the root provides carbohydrate and lipid. In angiosperms, which are the main group of plants that we deal with, the hyphae actually penetrate into the root and into the root cells and construct a membrane over which this exchange actually happens. The bacterial microbiome is about a thousand species in number and improves defense reactions by some of the chemicals that they produce, particularly against disease. But a very important aspect of this mycorrhizal network is it conveys information about disease or pests to adjacent plants enabling defense. I've shown up here if this particular plant is being attacked by a predatory pest, 
That information goes down through the network to the adjacent plants there that perceive that and can prepare their defense reactions. If that one's getting diseased, attack, that information goes back through this hyphal network to the adjacent plant in turn. We should also realize that this is, of course, a two dimensional picture here. It's actually in three dimensions, and there'll be numerous other plants sharing this common mycorrhizal network, enabling information flow between this little group here. Game theory is applicable because you do get free riders amongst the mycorrhizal hyphae. And the situation of the environment here helps construct an environment for siblings, can get preferential benefit, that's been shown by Simo and Simard. Intelligent behavior, adaptively variable behavior during the lifetime of the individual. That's a suitable definition. There are many of these, they all say effectively the same thing, increases individual survival probability. The trait responses I show you below uh, are very, do vary amongst individuals. I can use four examples here of signals that alter plant development. First of these is wind or touch. Even fairly small blasts of wind will dwarf the plant compared to those that are not. If there's a water deficit, then the roots become more profuse and they grow much more deeply, more quickly. In deep shade, the leaves become very much bigger. They have more chlorophyll and there's an anatomical readjustment inside to ensure that they capture many more of the much lower concentration of photons. And competition, the reflected light from the competition is far red light. It's enriched in the far red and plants can perceive that and take action accordingly if they perceive competition coming by growing much more quickly, taller. The idea is to outgrow the opposition and hopefully by that means get their flowers in a position in which they can be pollinated. Transgenerational inheritance, extremely common in plants, uh, greater than 60 reports. The maternal environment experience of temperatures, hot or cold, herbivory, salt stress, shade, drought, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, soil characteristics, a viral bacterial resistance appear in siblings for anywhere from one to nine generations. Nearly 20 of these observations have been shown to improve sibling fitness. DNA methylation histone marks are considered as explanations. Earliest perhaps that I know of is that of Darrington Flax, started in 1952 and done properly. He put seeds in a mixture of nitrogen phosphate potassium, which a plant would re, re uh, would sense as in fact very beneficial for growth and it produced bushy phenotypes. If you get an imbalanced mineral resource, such as just nitrogen and potassium, it produces these sparse plants. If you take the progeny from these, no matter what environment you put them on, thereafter they remain bushy or sparse. Lamarckian kind of inheritance. I live in an old schoolhouse and abutting that schoolhouse is a lane and then there's a wall against the next garden and there's always been soil there and it's been there for some time. I've grown Shirley poppies in that soil there for some 20 years and the normal poppy that you get out for Parva rias is about a meter high, thousands of seeds in every capsule that you get in that sort of picture I've shown you here. I couldn't get everything in to show the root. However, some of this seed lands in a totally inappropriate place. For example, this mini poppy uh, was grown in about two millimeters of soil on top of tarmac. It was starved of all the appropriate things in life. But I want you to notice it had a root, a leaf, a pedicel, and a flower. And if you open the capsule of those, I've got about 10 this year, you find one or two seeds compared to the thousands which you get from that one. To me, that indicates the goal to survive and reproduce is one of the real driving forces uh, behind what we call teleonomy. You don't have to do it just with the uh, Papava we're talking about, Papava somniferum, which you see here is a mophead poppy. 
If these seeds land in the wrong place, often compacted so uh, stone structures of the lane, you end up with a tiny flower, tiny capsule compared to the, again, uh, the size is about one hundredth of the actual things which are there. How can evolution learn? This article by Trends in Ecology and Evolution by Watson and Zathmary, 2016. Uh, Watson leads a Southampton group. He's a computer scientist, basically, but they've used neural network learning theory introduced by Hopfield in 1982 in various publications to indicate important consequences to understand an ecosystem stability and memory. Incremental adaptation acquires knowledge from past experiences and use it to direct future behavior towards favorable outcomes and very important consequences, I think, come from that. Learning theory links incremental adaptation to intelligent behavior. Using the Hebbian formulations of neural network learning, that means you change the strength of the connections between the neural network. They find long-term memories are embedded, enabling recovery and stabilizing composition. That's important in convergent evolution. You'll find 15 examples of this in plants, so it's relatively common. The critical point is how similar morphology or biochemistry emerges from entirely remote lineages, but similar environmental constraints. There's a review in Science in 2018 that covers some of these areas, but I have to ask the question here, is it this complication or this interaction between phenotype and environment is it a long-term memory embedded in the participants of the uh, ecosystem or is it by biomechanical constraints? The, the well-known examples here, the old world euphorbias, which you see here, or the new world cacti, cactaceae, they all look the same and it's a water deficit, so they live in the deserts, but the old world and the new world, of course, party company, a hundred, hundred million years ago. About 40 million years ago, carbon dioxide levels got extremely low in the atmosphere. Consequently, a new form of photosynthesis appeared. Uh, C4 is the new one and C3 is the old one. C4 is more efficient. It obviously evolved in monocots, such as uh, this is a maize uh, or corn plant, if you're in America, in Zia and as a C4 dicot there, uh, monocots and dicots separated uh, between themselves about 170 million years ago. So again, when the need arises, then you seem to find plants that will in fact evolve to actually take account of that. And I think that leads to the last one, and um, that um, the cytoplasmic calcium, that is now my message to um, for Simon to take over. And uh, your screen sharing, I'll stop share there and leave Simon to carry on. All right, well, thanks Tony for setting me up. Um, so I think all of the ideas that Tony has been presenting to plant biologists are pretty intuitive. The, I mean, people argue about the, um, the terminology, but the ideas behind it are pretty widely accepted. But I know for a lot of people, it doesn't quite feel right. Um, so, you know, plants are attractive, plants are nutritious, um, but ideas about agency um, and ideas about teleonomy don't quite fit because of this issue that we have that we see how organisms operate in the realm of our human experience. So we're expecting movement and rapid responses and we just don't see that in plants. And so, you know, I teach introductory biology and for many students, plants are living rocks, all right? So how do we, uh, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about signal transduction in plants to sort of tip the balance towards us at least beginning to appreciate how dynamic they really are when you develop ways to look at that. So fortunately, uh, 
cytoplasmic calcium turns out to be an incredibly important and ubiquitous cellular regulator. It's the reason that your hearts are beating at the moment. It's the reasons that your nerves are firing. Uh, and because it's such an important widespread, widespread regulator of biology, there's been a big thrust to develop ways to look at it in real time. And so what I'm showing here is just an absolutely remarkable movie. This, the, the movie which is playing out on the right, is a mouse brain in an intact mouse which is being imaged. And what you're seeing is the calcium changes in the firing of the neurons and the astrocytes that make up a functioning mouse brain. So you're seeing mouse thought in action. Uh, and it's this is done with a transgenic approach. It uses a biosensor protein which has been genetically engineered into the mouse. And the important thing for us here is when it gets brighter, when you see the flashes of green, that is, at a cellular level, a calcium signal being generated. Fortunately, this technology, it works in animals, it works in mice, but it also, you can transfer it directly to plants, and it opens up a window on what it means to be a plant. So I just want to show really quickly a couple of examples just to get us to reset our ideas about what it means for a plant to be growing in the environment and all of the ideas that this conference is built around. So the first one is a classic example. This is the Venus flytrap. Many of you will know this. This is a plant that catches flies. Uh, evolution has equipped it with a flytrap. The flytrap is a bear trap. It's going to snap shut and it's modified leaves. Right? Uh, on the surface of the leaves, it's colored to attract flies, red, you know, rotting meat, that kind of, of attractant. But on the surface of the leaf, there are sensory hairs and a fly that's wandering through that trap has to trigger those sensory hairs. And it turns out that cytoplasmic calcium is part of the signaling mechanism that underlies how this trap fires. And it just gives you a different appreciation of how fast plants really work in the real world. So here is the fly trap. Uh, it, we're going to come in and just, just bat it around like the wind was blowing it. The system is clever enough not to be triggered just by those wind movements. But if you trigger a hair, not once, because again, that could be wind or a leaf falling on the trap or something like that, but trigger it twice within 30 seconds and the trap shuts. Right? So there's an information processing system here tailored to capture a fly clambering through the trap. Um, so we can take our calcium sensing technology, and this was done by the Hasebe group in Japan, and engineer a flytrap plant to express the calcium sensing protein. So now, exactly like we were seeing with the mouse brain, we can image the information moving through this trap. And so what the, I'm going to show you is a movie, and the movie is of the trap, and you can see in the top right-hand corner, there's the picture of what we're looking at, right? So there's the trap of, of a plant which is expressing this calcium sensor. The red line you can see is actually a physical manipulation probe. And we'll see in a second, it's touching one of those sensory hairs. And so all that the movie is, is in real time, we're gonna deflect the hair once, wait a few seconds. Remember, we have to be within 30 seconds and deflect it again. And the green color you're gonna see is the sensing and the information processing that this modified leaf is doing. So there's the first trigger and there's the wave of calcium moving across the trap. Nothing's happened. There's the second trigger. So we'll just play it again. And that second triggering with the calcium waves, that triggers closing of the trap. So if you think what you're seeing there, well, you're seeing information processing that requires two events. So there's a molecular memory built in here, has to occur within a period of time, and there has to be two. We have plants counting and we have plants remembering things. And I don't think that's a huge surprise to any biologist that evolution has equipped plants just like it's equipped animals and all other organisms with the ability to take information from the past, move it into the present, to make some calculation about what the correct adaptive thing to do. But the other thing that it does is it brings plants in their ability to respond to the world into our human timeframe. This is occurring 
if you look at it, just over the course of seconds, and we have signals propagating through an organ of a plant over the, over the time course of milliseconds. So the second example that Tony uh, sort of intimated about a little bit was herbivory. And again, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna use a calcium sensor to image what the plant is do doing. Um, that, that caterpillar there is a cabbage white, a pieris butterfly. That is a predator of plants. And plants have a way of dealing with that. They can have static defenses that are already there, things like spines. They can have pre-existing chemical defenses, which are fantastically effective and could, can kill human beings, right? We know there are toxic plants. Plants are masters of biochemistry. They can just grow so much that they can throw parts of them away to herbivory. They can outgrow the herbivory. They, photosynthesis is such a, a productive approach to biology that that's another example of, of dealing with it. I did, yeah. Um, so, but does that require an awareness of the world around them? Well, no, but a lot of these defenses are costly at a carbon and energy level, and they are switched on. And they are switched on, as we've seen, to be in the sensing of the world around them. So we're going to look at another leaf, right? And we have here another caterpillar. And you're going to see the caterpillar, and it's going to be green, and you're going to be able to see it moving around. And to the left is a cartoon of what we're seeing in the movie where we're looking at leaves of a plant which are expressing this, this calcium sensor, right? And when it gets brighter, remember, that is the plant sensing something and firing off cellular signals within the plant. Uh, and remember, Simon, so I, I, plant, hmm? Simon, I hate to interrupt you, but yep. you're fast running out of time, I'm afraid. Yeah, yep. I do. Thank you. One more minute, yep. So, um, so we're plant biologists, we have soft hearts. This is a well-fed caterpillar, right? So there is the caterpillar walking around. Remember, it's not eating the plant, but the plant can see its footprints, right? The plant is sensitive enough to the world around it. It is seeing the, the caterpillar and it knows it's being crawled on. It's not being eaten. What happens when it's being eaten? Okay, so we can harden our hearts and not feed the caterpillar and do exactly the same thing, right? And so you're gonna see what happens when a plant is attacked now. And remember, this is this is only sped up about 12 folds. So we're in the realm of time frame of a human, human operations. And so there is the plant being eaten, and there are waves of calcium information moving throughout that plant. And they're moving at millimeters a second. So it's not a plant nervous system. It's not the plant feeling pain, right? Those are that's an experiential thing which requires a brain, but this is a plant with solving the same kind of issues that animals have of needing a communication system to integrate its activities. But the most important thing for us is it moves plants into that time frame of how we think biology works. And so elements of things like agency, they become a big deal for plants just as much as they are for animals and also for bacteria. Um, but that seems like a good place to stop with, with a plant screaming in pain. Remember, it's not in pain. Um, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, it's a um, so hopefully that allows us to put plants into the same realm of of animals and think a little bit about how the ideas that we're talking about fit across all of the kingdoms of biology. Wow, thank you so much. That was that, I thought that was truly fantastic. Thank you both. Thank you, uh, Tony and Simon, for a real really important insight because the, the, the phenomena we're talking about here, if they have any real importance, they have to be affecting, I think, the whole of, whole of biology. So it's very pleasing to have that. Uh, we've just got a, a moment before we uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, which will be uh, Nathalie Gontier at uh, the half hour. Uh, Natalie contacted us last night um, to because she has some unexpected real-time problem with her plumbing, and there are people crawling all over, her, all over her apartment making terrible noises apparently. And so at the last minute, 
she had to, uh, or almost the last minute, she had to record her presentation and she's just apologizing for the fact that she's not going to do it live, but we were in contact earlier in the day. So anyway, uh, without uh, further delay, I think we can move on to our next speaker from Lisbon in Portugal, and it's uh, Professor Nathalie Gontier. And the title of her presentation, which is now pre-recorded, um, is Teleonomy as a Problem of Causation and Causation as a Problem of Hierarchy and Time. So Padma, can you press the button? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Natalie Gontier and I work at the Faculty of Science of the University of Lisbon, where I am sponsored by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. Today I'm going to be talking about teleonomy as a problem of causation and causation as a problem of hierarchy and time. So the main argument of my presentation today is going to be that when we talk about teleonomy or when we talk about teleology, we need to think about causation and we need to think about time. And that is because any kind of goal directedness or agency or theorizing about final causes, about uh, coming and becoming, always is something that occurs within time. And so what we are going to do is we're going to look into the correlation that exists between causality and time. And time itself is a problem because there are many scholars today that say that time does not exist. And so we're going to uh, look into that. And we find evidence for that also uh, in so far as that different cultures have developed different concepts of time. And that is also the case for scientific history. So we're going to look into how time has been defined differentially within scientific history. Then we're going to look into causation and hierarchy theories, and we're going to end by looking into the nature of self-causation. So to understand time, we need to look into cosmologies. And I define cosmologies as worldviews on the nature of matter, space, and time. So time thinking always associates with space thinking and with thinking on matter. And so we're going to look into the cosmologies of the ancient Greeks, the Romans and the Judeo-Christians, classical physics and natural history, and modern physics and evolutionary biology. And these cosmologies are often depicted into cosmographies, and cosmographies are typical diagrams that capture the basic aspects of a certain cosmology. And so the ancient Greeks, their cosmographies are wheels of time or chains of being. For the Romans and the Judeo-Christians, it's scales of nature or chronologies and pedigrees. For classical physics and natural history, it is timelines and phylogenetic trees. And for modern physics and evolution and biology, we see networks, and these are formulated in vector spaces or in graph theory. So one of the things that my research has demonstrated is that there is a very strong correlation between how these different cosmologies understand causality and how they understand time. So ancient Greeks, ancient Greeks understand causality in cyclical terms and they also understand time as circular. Romans and Judeo-Christians uh, adhere to a form of non-uniform teleology and they assume that time is linear. Uh, classical physics and natural history understand the world in terms of uniform, of un non-uniform teleology, and they uh, understand time as multilinear. And then modern physics and evolutionary biology uh, questions the existence of time, and if it does exist, it is multidirectional. But here also people have started to question whether or not there is such a thing as causality. And instead they have averred that there are no causes, but only statistical probabilities and uncertainties. So let's look into some examples. An example of a wheel of time is a life cycle. Um, so if you look into uh, the life cycle of a sunflower, then we see that seeds bring forth the seedling, seedlings bring forth sprouts, the sprout brings forth a plant with a budding flower that grows into a full plant, and then that plant dies and it drops its seeds, and then the circle uh, or the cycle starts again. And so this is a cycle of coming and becoming, or of generation and decay. And so it is from within this cycle of coming and becoming that Aristotle introduces his four causes. 
And so um, looking at his sunflower, he asks himself the question, how do you go from the seed to the sunflower? How do you go from the potential that is inside of the seed to the actualization of that potential, the sunflower? And so in that regard, the seed is basically unformed matter with potential. And so that is what he calls the material cause, that out of which a thing comes. Now, um, what the potential is of unformed matter pertains to the essence of a thing because not everything can become everything so a seed will become a flower and that is because it is the essence it is what a seed is supposed to do and so um, that pertains to the formal cause and so the essence of a seed is to grow into a flower now the efficient cause then asks how that potential becomes actualized and that is true for example water sunlight and fertile soil and that does pertains to the how question it is a question about the mechanisms or or the the, the things required to obtain the goal and so in this regard the efficient cause is external uh, to to um, the thing under study so um, water, sunlight and fertile soil is something that is given to the seed from the outside to become the flower. And then the final cause is the end or the reason of becoming and why the potential got actualized. And that pertains to the what and the, the why and the what for question. And that asks about the goal, the function or the final end state of a thing. So here the goal of the seed is to grow into a flower. And so what we see then is that the formal cause and the final cause converge. So the essence of a seed is to grow into the flower and it is also immediately its end state, its goal. And then the question is, so once the actualization has occurred of the potential, then what then? What happens then? And then here in ancient times, what happened was uh, the eternal return, the myth of the eternal return. This is a concept that I borrow from Mircea Eliad, and he says that that is something that we find in all uh, cultures that think cyclically and that adhere to a circular notion of time. There is the idea that uh, everything starts anew, so there is no second law after more dynamics, there is no complete loss, just things restarting. And then what happens over time within natural history is then that that circularity and that return gets straightened out and time becomes an arrow. So typical of Judeo-Christian tradition is that um, time becomes understood as linear, as something that has a beginning and has an ending and then there also we see that time also becomes uniform through uh, numbers so time becomes equated with a linear timeline going from zero to one two three four five six etc and so examples of that then are uh, scales of nature or the stairways to heaven and these in the beginning are ahistorical so um, they do not depict time at all in fact what they demonstrate is a spatial arrangement of how far are cl or, or close organisms and entities find themselves from their deity so in that regard in organic matter for example stands the furthest away from the deity and it is considered the least perfect and so uh, humans then on the other hand are uh, assumed to be closer the closest of all living entities to their deity and so this is a special way of thinking about uh, uh, living entities and then in that regard these skills then uh, become the foundation whereupon natural history research is done and whereupon uh, scholars are going to try to impose time uh, upon these sequences and it are these skills of nature that then become naturalized and uh, naturalized here means that they uh, form the basis of chronologies of natural history and there also then they form the basis to add timelines and so what is interesting here is that these chronologies or these timelines in the beginning are uh, non-uniform so um, the geological time scale for example is a scale uh, that is very data driven in a way and it is uh, based upon how the geological strata uh, demonstrate themselves uh, in the earth 
and uh, that itself is not something that is uniform so also the geological time scale is not uniform also at that time uh, development becomes uh, something that is widely studied and there also in the beginning scholars look for the ages of uh, uh, of the cycle of life so and there for example you can be a baby for six months but you can be a teenager for 10 years so there also there is no uniformity and that is also something that we find in how they define teleology now causality within judeo-christian thinking is the hand of god so there does not need to be uniformity uh, uh, of cause and here then is where there is a shift and uh, their causation also becomes uh, uniform and it becomes linearized and it becomes naturalized and so here causation then becomes understood as a linear and a timely relation between cause and effect and so here is where a starts to bring forth b and where a is said to have a priority in time over b and that also means that if you have a b you can backtrack to an a and this is exactly what we see in evolutionary biology. And here Darwin is actually the first to add a numerical timeline onto the hypothesized tree of life that he introduces in the origin of species. Now, scholars like to say that ever since the introduction of mechanistic thinking or mechanical thinking, uh, scholars only ask the how question. But that is not the case for evolutionary biology. And one of the scholars to uh, make the how and the what for question uh, respectable again within evolutionary biology was Ernst Meyer. And so um, here he made a distinction between functional biologists that ask the how question and evolutionary biologists that ask the why question. And so he said that a functional biologist is vitally concerned with the operation and interaction of structural elements. His ever repeated question is how, how does something operate, how does it function? And his approach is essentially the same as the one of the physicist and the chemist. And so here is where he defines proximate causation. Now, evolutionary biologists, he say, ask the why question. So the evolutionary biologist differs in his method, and his basic question is why. It may mean how come, but it may also mean the finalistic what for. It is obvious that the evolutionist has in mind the historical how come when he asks why. And so here he makes a distinction between uh, the why as how come, which is directed to the past, and the what for, which is a question that is directed towards the future and that asks about teleonomy. And so here is also where he uh, places ultimate causation. And then Dawkins later, he says that the methodology of functional and evolutionary biologists is the same. And so he says, what kind of explanation for complicated things would satisfy us? We have just concerned the question from the, considered the question from the point of view of mechanism. How does it work? But another kind of question is how the complicated things came into existence in the first place. And the same principle uh, applies as for understanding mechanism. Now today we are also much further than that because we do not only ask what uh, evolves and how it evolves, we also ask where it evolves. And that is because of the introduction of the units and levels of uh, evolution debate and also because of the recognition that there are different kinds of evolution that is something that is being debated within the extended evolutionary synthesis and also within the third wave of evolution where scholars recognize the existence of many more mechanisms beyond natural selection whereby evolution can occur now um, in that regard and that is something that i call applied evolutionary epistemology we can even define evolution according to uh, these questions we can say evolution occurs universally when units evolve at levels of an ontological hierarchy by mechanisms and processes and we can say that studying any kind of evolution universally involves a search for units levels and mechanisms or processes and allocating these into ontological hierarchies and so the emphasis here then lies on on ontological hierarchies and this I think is also the question of our generation we need to think about evolutionary hierarchies because that is how also we define causation 
And so when we look into uh, the tenets of the neo-Darwinian synthesis according to these terms, then for them what evolves, what is the unit of evolution is the organism. It evolves at the level of the environment by means of natural selection or by drift. And so that is a mechanical account that endorses the notion of upward causation, because although um, organism evolution is assumed to occur at the organismal environmental level, uh, it is furthermore assumed that uh, an organism uh, is brought forth by genes on a micro level and that organisms then as such result into the formation of uh, different species at a macro level. And so um, this is also why scholars try to reduce uh, evolution to the study of genes and how they spread because there is the assumption that there can be a reduction to a micro level. Now, upward causation theories follow the flow of time. They follow the flow of natural history. And so they look into affordances. So they look into how genes afford uh, or enable the evolution of organisms and how organisms enable or afford the evolution of species. And so that is a research focus that is focused on temporal change. Um, and then downward causation is the study of how ecology or ontogeny or behavior um, is able to constrain the future course of evolution. But when there is such a thing as that constraint, uh, then that occurs within the ecology of nature and within development. And so that is something that has a spatial outlook. And then there, uh, the idea is that there can be downward causation, that how uh, organisms uh, behave within the economy of nature can bring forth uh, change long term. And beyond the recognition that there can be upward and downward causation within the same evolutionary hierarchy, hierarchy theory has evolved towards the recognition that there exist different hierarchies. And in this regard, for example, Niles Eldridge has distinguished between, on the one hand, the economic hierarchy and, on the other hand, the genealogical hierarchy. And so the genealogical hierarchy is a hierarchy that investigates how uh, genes bring forth organisms and how organisms bring forth species. But then these uh, organisms and these species uh, exchange much more than genetic material. They exchange matter and energy within the economy of nature and that brings forth a different hierarchy. Because on the one hand you have the genetic uh, inheritance uh, of organisms, but on the other hand selection remains something that occurs within the economy of nature. And so because of that you have a dual hierarchy. But there is more. Um, these classic hierarchies and also upward and downward causation in and of itself do not suffice to explain uh, aspects of reticulate evolution. So um, reticulate evolution is evolution as it occurs by means of symbiosis, symbiogenesis, lateral gene transfer or hybridization. And so uh, when we try to model these phenomena, then these classic hierarchies and also upward and downward causation do not suffice to capture the specific nature of reticulate evolution. And uh, so, for example, when scholars say that there is lateral gene transfer, then what happens is that the genes of one organism are transferred to the genes of another organism. And that is something that you cannot simply depict into these genes, organisms, species, hierarchies. So what you need to have there is multiple hierarchies, uh, such as the ones that were introduced by Niles and Eldridge. But these multiple hierarchies also have to uh, exchange uh, information or matter and energy reticulately. And this then is what I have been uh, defining as reticulate causation. And so reticulate causation is the form of causation that occurs between, between genes, organisms and species belonging to different hierarchies. Now to recapitulate, over the course of natural history, we have seen the introduction of different hierarchies, different ways of hierarchy thinking. In association with these different hierarchies, we see a shift 
in the locus of causation and also in how accordingly we define causation. So if we look into pre-evolutionary views, we see that causation is considered something that is external to the living world. And so the inorganic, the organic and the superorganic, for example, is something that is subjected to forces or to laws or to divine will. But all of that is something that stands outside of uh, the living world and that then motivates the living world to change. Now, with the rise of the modern synthesis, we still have a partial idea of that. We have the idea that environmental selection uh, occurs upon the organism. So you have the organismal environmental interface, which is the locus of selection, and then um, a selection occurs from the environment to the organism. But at the same time, because of the rise of molecular genetics, you have uh, what Lewontin would call the internalization of selection, where people investigate how genes bring forth organisms and organisms bring forth species. But so you have the idea of multi-level selection and also of um, uh, selection operating within the organism. Now, um, it is here also that we find this distinction between proximate causation and ultimate causation. Proximate causation being internal and ultimate causation being external to the organism. Now, with the rise of theorizing on the extended evolutionary synthesis and with the field of Eco Evo Devo, you have the distinction between upward and downward causation. But what happens here is that people only study the internal aspects of a genealogical hierarchy. And here then, for example, uh, Niles Eldritz uh, is, is uh, pointing out that this is only one side of a hierarchy, that this is the genealogical hierarchy where uh, scholars study up and downward causation, but that ignores um, the ecological hierarchy the, where there is environmental selection. And that is also the reason why he introduces this dual hierarchy. Now, with the introduction of reticulate evolution studies, we also uh, introduced the notion of reticulate causation. And what we see here is that two hierarchies, a genealogical and an ecological, is not enough. Instead, we need to look into how different units and levels interact reticulately with one another. And that brings forth different hierarchies, many more than two. Now, so far we have investigated causation upwardly, downwardly, and reticulately. But then there is another question that pertains to the study of causation, that is whether or not there can be something like self-causation. And so self-causation would be that a specific level, let's say the focal level, causes itself, that there is a causa sui, uh, a sui generis, that there is something at the focal level that is able to cause itself. And when you think about that, that immediately brings forth again a circular um, diagram or a circular notion of causality. And so this brings forth again the idea of there being some kind of circularity, but um, to go back to our classic example of the sunflower, now when we look into that circularity, we do not look into the life cycle of the sunflower, we look into how seeds um, bring forth a seedling and how that in a different moment in time brings forth a sprout and in a different moment in time brings forth a plant with budding flowers, etc., etc. And in this regard, not being part of a, an ancient worldview where we assume the existence of essences, what we have here is T1 bringing forth T2 and T2 bringing forth T3 and T3 bringing forth T4. And so we have a linear um, notion of causality where T1 causes T2 and T2 causes T3. Now, if it is so that T1 causes T2 and T2 to causes T3, then um, we are not talking about self-causation because it is not the self that causes it. It is different entities in time that bring forth something. 
And so here is where you see the paradox of uh, theorizing on self-causation. Um, when you add time to the equation, then T1 brings for T2, T2 brings for T3, but, um, and that brings for the linearization, um, but that brings also for the question of duration, identity and individuality. So whether or not there is some kind of continuity from the seed to the seedling, whether the seedling and the sprout are the same individual and whether they have some kind of identity. But that is the question, does there need to be identity over time? And my answer to that is no, because evolution is changed through time. So you can have a gene, that gene can mutate. A mutated gene might have a historical origin in one gene, but at a different moment in time, it is a different gene. And so in that regard, you can also look into the evolution of species. Species bring forth other species, but it are different species in time. And so there is no essence, there is change, and there does not need to be identity. So self-causation can be linearized. And then the question is, is there room for some kind of self-causation linearized within evolutionary biology? And then there, I think that there is, and in fact, I think that there is at any level. So genes can bring forth genes over time. Organisms can bring forth organisms over time and species can bring forth species over time. And so examples at the genetic level would be the hypercycle, at an organismal level, reproduction, and at the species level, how species uh, interact and then through their interaction, uh, bring forth new species in the economy of nature through, for example, something like holobiont formation, or also just through speciation. Um, so in that regard, that exists and that is possible that it is out there. And then a critical scholar might say, yes, but in order for organisms, for example, to bring forth species, you have to have genes that bring forth organisms and uh, organisms that bring forth species. And that is also true, but then there I would just say that we have two hierarchies interacting with one another. And so then we have to look into that matter reticulately. But then if the other becomes the new normal, then we can go further and ask ourselves uh, another question. And that I think is the most controversial part of the entire debate, whether or not there is some kind of uh, privileged position or a central processor then somewhere that then again takes control over the entire system, hierarchy, cycle, whatever you wanna call it. And so this relates to questions of self-regulation or agency and also uh, to the question of the Gaia hypothesis, whether there is some kind of steering entity that then uh, also somehow brings forth the entire uh, hierarchy. I have no immediate answer to the question, but in uh, regard to the, the possibility or impossibility of individualizing causality, I want to raise some further issues. Um, for example, when you look into uh, law, there uh, the concept of individualizing causality is basically what founds our law system and what founds our idea of responsibility and of uh, um, 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 uh, accountability of a certain crime. So when a delinquent, for example, has committed a crime, he might say that he has bad genes, he might say that he has bad upbringing or bad friends or whatever, but it is the delinquent eventually that commits the crime and that is also prosecuted as such. And so there, there is some kind of autonomy or agency that is considered to exist. So if we assume that it exists there, there is no reason to assume that it does not exist in nature, in biology or anywhere else. Uh, also, uh, in, in the paper that uh, Peter Corning wrote and that is foundational for this uh, workshop, um, Evolution on Purpose, How Behavior Has Shaped the Evolutionary Process, there also we can say that behavior actually shapes and gives directionality to the future course of evolution. Also in uh, the cognitive sciences, Maturana and Varela, their concept of um, self-regulation uh, and of autopoiesis, um, brings forth some kind of individualizing causality. And also holobiont formation, for example, brings forth some kind of individualizing causality. In that regard also, I, I have introduced the notion of uh, biorealities. The living world constantly enacts and brings forth 
the world. And so in that regard, we constantly uh, uh, bring forth evolution. And in this regard, I want to uh, leave you with a quote of uh, Driesch, who wrote that if a system passes through several phases of becoming in succession, all controlled by unifying causality, we may speak of the evolution of the system and every singularity of becoming that leads to the unity as the final end may be called purposive or teleological. And so with this, I hope that I have uh, contributed to the anatomy of the debate. And I want to thank uh, Peter Corning and Dick Van Wright and very kindly so for uh, this invitation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. It was extremely interesting with much food for thought, I think. Uh, well, we are at the hour, so um, we need to continue. And our next speaker is uh, Professor Francis Hagen from the Free University of Brussels. And his presentation is entitled, The Origin of Goal-Directed Organization Towards a Mathematical Model. So over to you, Francis, and thank you very much. Okay, uh, I hope everybody uh, can hear me. So what I'm reporting on is actually a new project that we have started at our Santa Leo Apostle at the Free University of Brussels, a project that I'm leading together with my colleague uh, Thomas Velos and which got one and a half million dollars from the Templeton Foundation. Now the project has just started six months ago, so I can't really report on very concrete results yet. But what I want to explain here is a conceptual framework, which I think is very relevant to the topic of the conference. So what is the project about? It's called the origins of goal directedness. And the idea is to make a theoretical analysis, to make a mathematical model and to make computer simulations of how goal directed systems can emerge. And the general idea is that this would help us to explain fundamental questions such as the origin of life, the origin of social systems, because social systems are after all also coherent goal-directed systems, and then the classical major transitions in evolution, where you have a number of initially independent systems that then start cooperating and start developing a common purpose. Now, it's interesting to know that this project is funded by the John Templeton Foundation under a program that is called the Science of Purpose. Uh, I have listed below uh, the link to that program. Uh, for people doing this kind of research, it may be worth applying there. It is very much close to uh, the topic of this conference. So I can illustrate that by some quotes from the website of uh, the Templeton Foundation Science of Purpose program. So this program is supposed to support research that seeks to clarify and test notions of apparent goal-directed processes in the sciences. And they're specifically speaking about physics of life, chemistry and biology. Uh, and uh, the quote notes that many biotic and even some abiotic systems may be set to display agentic behaviors that appear to be self-correcting and target-oriented. So all these terms are kind of similar terms to what I call goal-directedness, agency, target-oriented, self-correcting. And then specifically the program asks how do such processes emerge and how are they maintained? And can we conceptualize them in rigorous ways? So rigorous ways, meaning things that are more or less quantifiable, objectifiable, and that may help us to advance empirical investigations. So that is what, what our project is trying to do. So let me start by uh, summarizing what I call the problem of goal directedness. Now, Goal directedness actually is something very common and intuitive. We are surrounded by systems that are goal directed, like all living systems, like people, like organization, even by robots and some might say thermostats. So take a typical example from biology. When you see a lion hunting a zebra, 
you know that the goal of that line is to catch and kill the zebra and that its actions are directed to this goal and that the line uses a number of morphological and other functionalities like claws, teeth and legs that are there specifically to support this goal-directed behavior. So intuitively, it's all very obvious that there is this goal-directedness, yet in traditional science, goal-directedness has always been kind of a almost taboo term. And that is specifically connected with the term of teleology. And teleology means that a process is determined by the end. So it's what Aristotle called the final cause. You try to explain the process by what it will lead to. Now, that is intrinsically a problem with traditional view of causality. The traditional view of causality, we assume that causes produces effects that are in the future. That means something that is in the future, an end, something that does not exist yet, cannot reach back to the present. Causality means that the present can affect the future, but not that the future can affect the present. So I have depicted it here in the following way. So suppose I have a system that goes to different states. It follows a trajectory to its state space from the past to the present. And we assume that it is directed towards a goal, but this goal is in the future. That means it doesn't exist yet. So final causation would mean that somehow this goal can reach back to some kind of a wormhole in space-time to influence what's happening here. So obviously, this is not compatible with the traditional uh, uh, scientific paradigm. So then, uh, biologists in particular have replaced this notion of teleology because it was kind of difficult, because it was kind of controversial by the word teleonomy. So one of the definitions for teleonomy I found is apparent goal directedness. That means we see things in the natural world that behave or that look as if they are directed towards a goal, but we don't really say that they are. So. It looks teleological, but it's not really theological. So to me, that sounds more like a cop out than like a clarification of what goal directedness really means. So my um, thesis here is that goal directedness in living systems is real. It's not something apparent. The line is effectively directed towards the goal of catching and killing the zebra. But in order to avoid all these difficulties with uh, mystical notions like God imposed purposes or uh, conscious intentions or uh, future states reaching back to the present, we need to have a definition of goal directedness that is explicit, that means unambiguous, clear, formal, and that is operational, that means that you can somehow go and look for it in the real world, you can do experiments, you can do observations. So what I want to propose here first is a definition of goal directedness that is not in contradiction with causality, and that does not require any of these pre-existing uh, conscious intentions or far away ends that somehow reach back to what's happening here and now. So actually that problem of teleology was solved a long time ago already in the 1930s by Wiener who was the Wiener and Rosenblut who were the founders of cybernetics and cybernetics has solved the problem by introducing the notion of negative feedback. So you again have your system that is following a certain trajectory. Now, how do you know that this system is directed towards its goal? Not because the goal can somehow reach back to the present, but because you know that if you push the system away from its movement towards a goal, it will counteract or compensate that perturbation and it will still go to the goal. So you push it away in this direction and it goes back in the other direction, you push it away in this direction and it still goes to the goal. So negative feedback means when the system is made to deviate from its goal-directed uh, trajectory, it 
compensate, it goes back, it goes in the opposite direction of the push. Another way of, uh, of defining this is the notion used by the systems theorist uh, von Bertha Landfi, E qua finality. E qua finality means same finality for equal, different, the same finality for different initial states. So what we see in this kind of cybernetic situation is you push the system into different states and no matter where you push it, it always goes back to this goal. So equi finality, if we see that in nature, we can start to suspect goal directedness and we can test that simply, as I said, by introducing perturbations and then seeing is the system resisting my perturbation? Does it start moving against to the same goal? Then I can assume goal directedness. Now we want to create a mathematical model and the most common uh, formalism used nowadays to model change are so-called dynamical systems. So a dynamical system is a system that has a different states. It is in a state space. And it undergoes state transitions. There is some function, but we don't need to specify what that function is. Some function f, sorry, that goes from the state at present time t to the state at the next time t plus one. So knowing that function, we for each state we can determine what will be the next state and the next and the next and the next. So we can calculate the trajectory of the system. So at first sight, this is a purely causal model, not in goal directly. Now, there is a nice method of visualizing this kind of dynamic system and that is called a face portrait. So I have here drawn a face portrait. From each state, you just draw the arrow to the next state and you immediately see if the state starts somewhere here, it will go there. If it starts somewhere here, it will go there. You kind of get an idea of the directionality of the system. Now, to introduce the notion of goal, we need to introduce a concept of an attractor. Now, in dynamical systems theory, an attractor is a region in the state space to which the system will move and it will enter the attractor, but once in the attractor, it will not be able to get out anymore. So it may continue moving in this attractor, but once in the attractor, it will not get out. Now, surrounding the attractor is the so-called attractor basin. That means all the states that end up in a particular attractor. In this case, we see that this is the basin of this attractor. On the other side, we have a different basin leading to a different attractor. So now we can come to a definition of goal directedness. So I define a goal first. It's an attractor for the system. An attractor is a state or a collection of states. This attractor has a wide basin of attraction. That means there are many different initial states from which that all end up in this one attractor. And I add an additional requirement that is that the state of the attractor is not an equilibrium state. That means it's not something like a ball that's rolling down into a pit and coming to hold at the lowest part of the pit. That's not what we would call a goal-directed system. We will call it goal-directed if it's actively intervening to get into its attack. That means it requires energy. There must be an input, a flow of energy to reach and maintain that goal. So how do we see operationally whether a system like that is goal directed. Well, we see that whenever it's outside the goal, it moves towards it. Whenever it is in the goal, it stays there. Whenever you perturb it to push it away from its goal, it will react with energy and that energy will be directed at going back to the goal. So here's an a simple example of what we might call a homeostatic goal direct. That means there is one goal, a static place. Here is the basin from state E, it goes to F, and from F, it goes to the goal. But from state W, it also goes to the goal, and from V, it also goes to the goal. So 
all the states in this light green basin will lead to the dark green goal. And if we now perturb the system, if we push it, for example, from E to W, it will still go to the goal. That means the system will compensate the perturbation. You push it away from the goal, it comes back. Of course, it is always possible that if you perturb it too much, the red arrows, that you push it outside of the basin. And in that case, well, it will no longer be able to reach its goal. Here's another example. I was speaking about goals that are not so much static or equilibriums. More commonly, we may see a cycle. Here, the cycle is the goal, the attractor. The green cycle is the goal. From whatever in the basin, the system moves toward that cycle, stays on the cycle. If you perturb it, you push it away from the cycle, it goes back to the cycle. An even further example is what some have called homeoresis. It's not so much homeostasis, where you stay in a particular state, but homeoresis, where you stay in a particular movement. There is a flow, there is a certain trajectory, and whenever you perturb the system away from its trajectory, it compensates and it goes back to its trajectory. So from wherever position in this basin, the arrows show that it will go back to its preferred trajectory. In this case, the goal is not a state, but it is a flow, it's a movement. So now the project is about the origins of goal directness. How do we get such a system? And the principle is simple. Once you understand it, it's self-organization. Self-organization has been defined as global order emerging out of local interactions. That means that the order appears spontaneously. The, the system's own dynamics lead towards this ordered regime. There is no need for some external agent, some design, some intention, some blueprint. You don't need that. The system will end up there. And the principle of self-organization is a principle formulated already in 1947 by the cyberneticist Ross Ashby. And it actually says that the self-organization, it's almost tautological. It's, it's, it's so natural that there's nothing, there's nothing mysterious about it. And it just says a dynamical system will move towards its attractor and stay there. That's by definition of an attractor. And what Ashby added, he was not yet speaking about attractors because the terminology didn't exist in those days, but that's what he meant. Once the system is in the attractor, the different parts, that means the different components or processes that make up the system, they must be coordinated, they must be coherent, they must be mutually adapted. Because if they weren't, if the one was in conflict with the other, then the whole would not be stable and the whole would be brittle and it would fall apart. So self-organization means you spontaneously achieve a coherent system. Now, the most interesting types of these coherent systems are the living systems. And here, like Natalie before me, I refer to the work of Maturana and Varela where they defined life by the notion of autopoiesis. Autopoiesis being Greek for self-production. So what is an autopoietic system in their view? It's a network of processes that is what they called operationally closed. That means that the results of the processes are themselves. The, the processes reconstitute themselves. And that is kind of the idea of a living organism. Through the metabolism, things are broken down and reconstituted. But the whole idea is that the system is constantly rebuilding itself. So this is a system that has an implicit goal of self-maintenance, rebuilding itself, which is the same as survival. So this is the essence of uh, life. Now, the theory of autopoiesis has always been quite difficult and quite confusing and obscure, not obvious. But recently, uh, the computer scientist Peter Dittich has developed a simple formalization of this notion of 
autopoiesis, which was inspired by some of the autocatalytic models for the origin of life. And it's this formalization that we are using and that I want to explain. So you start from what are called reaction networks. So a reaction network is a notion that originally comes from chemistry, but it's much broader than that. It's a notion of processes where you have multiple inputs producing multiple outputs. So you get a network, but instead of a network going from one point to one point, it's a network that takes a combination of things and produces a combination of things. So what are the elements of your network? what are called species. The species can be molecules, obviously, when you speak about chemical reactions. They can also be biological species. They can be economic resources. They can be almost anything. And then you have reactions. And the reactions, what the reaction does is it takes a subset of the species and maps it onto a new subset of species, which we can understand as you transform some combination of species A and B, and you turn into a different combination of species D and E. So you have many species, you have many reactions working on these species, and that defines a reaction network. So now we come to the essential concept of Dietrich, which he called chemical organization theory and which we abbreviate as CRT. That is that some of these reaction networks, they will settle into what he called an organization. Now an organization is a subset of these species and these reactions that has two properties. On the one hand, it is closed. That means reactions produce species out of species, but they are closed at a certain moment, they are not producing any new species. They are only producing species that are already in the organization. And more importantly, the organization is self-maintaining. That means all the species that are consumed by some reaction are produced by some other reaction in such a way that they are not getting lost. So the organization is reproducing all the components. So this is the essence of autopoiesis. It's a process that keeps itself alive. But unlike autopoiesis and autocatalytic networks, it turns out that mathematically, this notion of uh, chemical organization is easy to define, easy to model, easy to simulate. So how does that help us to understand the organization, the, the origin of goal directedness? It is that organizations emerge spontaneously. So they are actually the attractors of the dynamics of reaction networks. How can we understand that? Start with a random reaction network. That means you have lots of species. These could be molecules. You have lots of reactions that make new species out of existing species. And some of these species are being consumed by a reaction and turned into something else, but nothing produces them again. That means you start out with those species, but you lose them. They disappear from your set. But while producing species, you add new ones. So the constitution of your set, set changes. Some get lost, some are added. But if you continue doing that, at a certain moment, you can't produce any new ones anymore. Well, all the old ones that are consumed but no longer produced have disappeared. And then you are left only with species that are produced as least as much as they are consumed. And that now makes your network into an organization. So let me give you a simple formal example. My species, which you could understand maybe as molecules, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's the set I start out with. And I have a number of reactions that consume and produce species. So one important reaction is a reaction of which the input is actually the empty set. It's a reaction that just adds A. It creates A. I don't know where A comes from, but in the model, I just have some supply of A. So you could see it as the food, the resources that get the cycle going. On the other hand, I have an output. That means there is some uh, species that is consumed that 
it doesn't remain in the organization. So it's the output. We could say that's the waste. But in between, I have this network of reactions that reproduces each of the elements again. For example, reaction one starts from G and turns it into C and B. B, together with A, is by reaction four turned into D. D is consumed by reaction R3 and together with F turned into B and C. C is consumed by R2 and turned into FEG. So now if you would follow these reactions, you see that all these a, B, C, D, E, F, G, they all remain in the system. So now that is not very intuitive maybe, so I'll give you a concrete example of the global ecosystem. Uh, Nathalie also mentioned the Gaia theory. So Gaia is the idea that we could see the earth as an autopoietic system. Well, let's make a very simple model of that in chemical organization. Well, first we need an input, which is sunlight. Then we have a process in which plants together with sunlight, carbon dioxide and minerals produce more plants and as a waste product, oxygen. Now plants are being eaten by animals and animals are also consuming oxygen. So animals eat plants and consume oxygen and they produce more animals. They also produce CO2 and they produce waste with a little bit of heat, let's say, as another product. Now the waste of the animals, that means the excrements, the dead animals, etc., together with the decomposers is turned into more decomposers, uh, CO2 and minerals. And now we see that we are back to where we started because where we started, we needed minerals and CO2 to feed the plants together with the sunlight, which we get for free. So the whole cycle just continues. So we Francis, can see what- Francis, I'm sorry to disturb you, but you have only four minutes left. I know, I know. Okay, thank you. Okay. So what's the overall goal of this Gaian system? It's just self-maintenance. Now, if we look at the components, we can say that each of these components has certain functions. The plants produce oxygen and food for the animals and absorb CO2, etc. I will switch those. Now, one more thing I need to add to this model of goal-directed system. I want this goal-directed system to be resilient. That means it should survive a wide range of environmental changes. That means it should be able to compensate for a wide range of perturbations. Now, in our mathematical model, we have defined three types of perturbations. The state perturbation, that means that the amount of species increases or decreases. Process perturbation, that means that Reactions can become more active or less active. And finally, the most interesting ones, the structural perturbations. New species can be added or can be deleted from the system so that new reactions are happening. So what is a resilient system? It's basically an attractor with a very wide basin of attraction. How does this resilience evolve? Through the evolutionary process of variation and selection. Assume you have an organization, how do you vary it? By adding species. If we think about biological organisms, we might think about the addition of molecules or the addition of genes or the deletion of molecules or the deletion of genes. That can be an effect of environmental change. Now, typically variation will destroy the organization or it may sometimes switch it into a different mode. But lots of organizations undergoing lots of organizations will lead to selection. Some of them will be able to survive, others will not be able to survive. And which ones will survive? The ones that I define to be resilient, that means those that had a wide basin of attraction. So in the longer term, the organizations will become better and better at coping with perturbations. A few features that may help a system to be more resilient. 
a notion sometimes used in biology, which is multi-degeneracy, which is related to pleiotropy or multifunctionality, which means that there is in biological organisms usually more than one way to get a certain effect. If a certain molecule must be produced by your metabolism and it requires one particular other molecule, and if that one molecule for whatever reason is not available, then you're stuck, unless you have a different pathway to produce that same molecule. Another one is negative feedback. That means if something goes down, there should be a process that produces more of it. And then another one is what is called overproduction. That means you produce more than you consume so that you have a reserve. So finally, in conclusion, goals can be seen as far from equilibrium attackers that have a wide basin of attraction that allows them to counteract a wide variety of perturbations. Such goal-directed systems can be seen to self-organize out of reaction networks simply by the reactions becoming closed and self-maintaining. That means that they form autopoietic organizations where everything that is consumed is also produced again. These organizations will undergo variation and selection will pick out the most resilient ones. And these are eventually the ones that will turn into the goal-directed organisms that we know. So I can stop here and leave it for the next speaker. Well, thank you very much, Francis. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure that's going to have a, a tremendous impact on, on our deliberations after the after the meeting and taking us forward towards the uh, to the publications. Unfortunately, we have to move on. And uh, our final speaker before the break is uh, Professor Eva Jablonka, Tel Aviv. Uh, and also in London. Uh, I think you're in London at the moment, are you, Eva? Yes. Uh, Eva's talk has the title From Teleonomy to Teleology, Evolutionary Considerations. Over to you, Eva, and thank you. Thank you. I think you're muted. Okay. Am I? No, you're right. Good. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, I, I will, I, I will try to talk about how we move from kind of intrinsic, uh, intrinsic kind of uh, goal directedness into something that could we be could actually be defined as teleology, something that requires some kind of mental states, subjective, subjectively experienced mental state, or reflective design. Okay, so I want to thank my colleagues and friends, uh, Simona Ginsburg and Anna Zeligowski. Anna Zeligowski did the pictures that you will see and my students and colleagues who contributed to this talk. Now the question that uh, I, uh, the, the question can be asked in uh, following Dennett's kind of the uh, Phrase. How do we go from doing things for a reason, for having reasons for doing things? So, uh, and I will define in order so that we have a common language, uh, a teleonomic behavior as a goal-directed behavior that does not depend on conscious will or preconceived design. Reasons here are phylogenetically selective adaptive decrees that have nothing whatsoever to do with subjective experiencing or reflective design. Mental states, on the other hand, are reasons to do things, and they are based on ontogenetic learning, conscious percepts, and satisfaction of felt needs. The goals to be satisfied are constructed by the organism, and in this sense, they are teleonomic. But the objects of the goals and the felt needs, for example, the food, the air, the mates, the body integrity, they are perceived by the organisms as goals to be reached, and there are representations mental representations within the organisms that represent these goals, which are perceived as external to the organism. And then we have also reasoned reasons, which require a symbolic system. They 
in addition to the external goals that satisfy private health needs animals have, there are also symbolic needs that are based on shared norms. And this is something that is special to humans, not to us, as far as we know. Now, the kind of approach that we adopt is uh, we, is me and Simona Ginsburg and my colleagues with whom I worked, are a kind of neo Aristotelian kind of uh, uh, approach. And we, and following Aristotle, we distinguish between three modes of being, what we call modes of being a living, non sentient mode of being, a sentient mode of being, and a rational, symbolic, human mode of being. So, uh, and since these modes of being are biological, they have evolved. And what is uh, this, this kind of carving of reality means that this, each of this mode of, be, uh, uh, of beings is delineated by sets of value systems and, 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 it has, and there are new types of goals for each of the stereological modes of being. And I will explain what I mean by that. Okay. So here is Aristotle just to, uh, just to give you a feel of how we think about this and where we draw our, uh, our kind of inspiration from. He said in the, in, uh, in the anima on the soul, of the psychic powers above enumerated, that's after a big discussion, some kinds of living things, as I have said, possess all, some less than all, other only one. Those that we have mentioned are the nutritive, the appetitive, the sensory, the locomotive, and the power of thinking. Plants have only the, the first, the nutritive while other orders of living things have this plus the sensory. By the sensory, by the way, he means actual, touch, actual subjective feeling, not just having a sensory ability in, in the sense of having a receptor and an ability to respond to stimuli, but actually having a subjective kind of experience. And lastly, certain living beings, a small minority, possess calculation and thought, for among mortal beings, those which possess calculations have all the other powers above mentioned. So he's talking about three types of what he calls souls, the nutritive soul, where you have a kind of intrinsic teleology, and the kind of sensitive souls, which have appetites, which are directed to things, to goals, which are perceived by the organisms as something to be reached outside it, and the reflective, uh, the reflective kind of, uh, or uh, the rational kind of soul, which uh, uh, is based on self-reflection and on sim symbolic goals, such as the desire to reach the beautiful, the just, the good, and so on. And here is just a small depiction of this uh, Aristotelian souls, the nutritive and reproductive. He, by the way, uses both. And he says that the nutritive is also the reproductive in living organisms, the sensitive that also is nutritive and reproductive, and the rational that in mortal beings is also sensitive and nutritive reproductive. So it's kind of nested hierarchy. A similar but not identical kind of uh, carving of reality has been suggested by Daniel Dennett. And he suggested a scheme that is based on kind of targets of selections. On, and his targets of selections are genes, behaviors, imagined action plans, and symbolic ideas, each of which can be selected. And he's talking about a, a tower of generating test, kind of tower where each new floor of the tower gets constructed, uh, as it gets constructed, it empowers the organisms at that level to find better and better moves and find them more efficiently. And here we, we are, here are what he calls Darwinian organisms, where design is through natural selection during phylogeny. Here we have what he calls Skinnerian organisms, where design is through the selective reinforcement of behaviors. And here's Skinner, where inherited behavior leaves off, the inherited modifiability of the process of conditioning takes over. This is learning the consequence and, select, and selection through reinforcement of behaviors. And here are the Popperian organisms, those that where design is through selection among imagined scenarios. And here are what he calls the Gregorian organisms, where design is through, through selected symbolic representations. And this is something that seems to be very 
uh, highly developed in humans, obviously, and probably specific to us. Now, I want to look at it from, to look at this mode of being from an evolutionary point of view, specifically to look at how a teleological kind of mode of being that is based on subjective experiencing, on mental states, on kind of representations of goals that are perceived as goals by the organism, how did it happen? So I'm asking, how did the evolutionary transition from non-conscious teleonomic organization to the first minimal level of conscious teleological organization occur? And in order to do that, I am looking at a, at a methodology and way of thinking that was developed by a great uh, Hungarian uh, chemist, Tibor Ganti, one of the fathers of systems chemi chemistry, and that was further developed by Minus Smith and Sattery for the origin of life. What Ganti asked is the following, how can we characterize a minimal teleonomic living system and evolutionary transition to it? And what he said, and the way that he approached this problem is the following. He said, although no one agrees precisely about what life is, there is enough consensus in the community of people who work on this about the capacity that a system would need to have to be recognized as living. So if we come to a different planet and we find a system with a certain list of, with a certain type of capacities, we will say, well, we can say that this system exhibits life. What are these capacities? So Gampi gave us a, a list. He said maintenance of a boundary, which is individuation, metabolism, stability, information storage, regulation of the internal milieu, growth, reproduction, and death, which is irreversible disintegration. And he also defined, identified a, one capacity that requires that all the entries in the list are in place. So there is a single capacity, and I will go, I will talk about it a little bit, that if it is in place, all the, uh, all this list of capacities that characterize the, the mode of being that we called living uh, exists. And then he built a, a, a toy model of such a system. So he, so this capacity that actually requ requires that the whole list of capacities characterize life is in place, it, it is, we call it an evolutionary transition marker. And according to Gunting, and then also it was elaborated also by Mann Smith and Sutmery, the evolutionary transition marker for sustainable life is what is the capacity of unlimited heredity. And unlimited heredity is the capacity to, for, it's not unlimited in the mathematical for, uh, sense. It is unlimited in the sense that it, the system, that there is a capacity to form lineage of open-ended length, varying in open-ended ways from the initial system. And the example that we know from uh, the world in which we live is the nucleic acid system. And th this is an example of an unlimited heredity system. And once we have a transition marker, such as unlimited heredity, and we identify it, we can reverse engineer from this, uh, uh, from, from this capacity to the system that enables it. So here is the basic logic of the whole, uh, uh, of the, of the whole thing. We, we start with, uh, with a list, individuation, metabolism, stability, at the bottom of this, uh, draw, uh, of this uh, illustration. And this list, is sufficient for the defin a definition of a system as a living system. And we find a single capacity that if it exists, it requires that all this, the capacities in the, uh, that are in the list are in place. And this capacity, unlimited heredity in the case of life, marks the presence of a living system. And it also allows us to reverse engineer from the capacity from this uh, uh, evolutionary marker to the system that enables it. So if we find, for example, on Mars, something like a, 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 a molecule that in theory can be self-replicating long molecules and so on, that are not one, but several, so they could not have been, uh, could not have been synthesized uh, spontaneously, 
we could reverse from this long polymer a system that can lead to its synthesis. And this system will have to ha will have all the capacity, all the, all the properties that are necessary to define a system as minimally living. And then he created a, a model, a chemotum. It's an autopoietic model of minimal uh, living system. By the way, just for to, to do justice, he developed this model, uh, which is a very detailed, uh, relatively detailed uh, chemical model, uh, more or less at the same time that Maturana and Varela, and independently of them, developed their, uh, their notion of uh, autopoietic system. And uh, in this system, we have uh, an input of uh, food, we have waste products, and we have several, uh, several systems that allow the construction of the boundary, uh, uh, a metabolic uh, kind of self-renewing metabolic cycle, and also a kind of informational subsystems that is uh, allowing the system to persist and to create, to, to, to vary in a way that uh, uh, ensures its persistence over long evolutionary times. I will not go into the system, it's very interesting, but that's a different story. But this is basically what he suggested. So he, he built, he, he gave us a list, he identified a capacity that requires that the list is in place. This is the evolutionary transition marker, and he built a model of a system that actualizes and manifests all the properties in the list. Now, we can generalize this approach. We can say, generally, an evolutionary transition marker is a property such that when we find evidence of it, we have evidence that the major teleological evolutionary transition in which we are interested has come to completion. And as I said there, we recognize three such great teleological transition, the transition to life, the transition to subjective experiencing, and this, uh, the transition to rationality. So this is the basic idea of the transition marker. We have a list of capacities that is sufficient for a description of a mode for the characterization and identification of a mode of being. And we identify a single property capacity that requires that the list of, uh, of that the list of capacities that we started with is in place. And this is the transition marker for that mode of being. So what about subjective experiencing? What can we say about that? Now, let's think about Tinbergen. Tinbergen, when he was trying to think about the organism, how we should think about behavior, he was thinking mainly about animal behavior, but we can think also about plant behavior, for example, about how the sunflowers move towards the sun. He asked, well, the question that we really need to answer is why do these animals or organisms behave as they do? And he offered four, he said that we have to ask four questions about causes if we want to answer this big question. The first, and we have to and we have to think about the mechanistic cause of the behavior, the mechanisms, the ontogenetic cause of the behavior, how it developed, the functional cause of the behavior, what it is good for, and the evolutionary cause of behavior that doesn't have to be the same as the functional, by the way. Then one thing can be, a particular behavior can be good for something, for one thing, but the reason that it uh, evolved and its uh, evolutionary history is completely different. And he said, well, we don't want to, uh, we can't think about the subjective experiencing because, not because it is not the cause, because in theory, we could ask, for example, when we ask ourselves, why did the frog say, well, jump because he was afraid? Now, is, not, is this not a cause? Why is it not within the list of Timbergen? He was aware of that. And in a footnote, he added, the ethologist does not want to deny the possible existence of subjective phenomena in animals. Claims it is futile to present them as causes since they cannot be observed by scientific methods. This was in 1951 and, we, and 70 years later, I think this is no longer a futile question. We can ask about the mental causes of a behavior. So let's apply the kind of methodology, and this is what we did. We, I'm talking about Simona Ginsburg and myself, uh, when we were trying to think about the evolutionary origins of minimal consciousness. So what is the list? Here is 
a suggestion of a list that is more or less a, con a consensus. If we will find an organism with all these capacities on a different planet, we will try to treat it with some amount of respect, not to hurt its feelings. So what are these capacities? One is binding and modification. For example, when we see something, we see the apple as both green and round. Global accessibility and broadcast. We form beliefs, we form multimodal integrations, generalizations, we have memories and so on. And all these things combine together to create the kind of subjective experiencing that we have. There's always selective attention and, and active exclusion. There's a lot of noise all the time, which we have to exclude it. We have something that we can call attentional skills. We select certain things to attend to, we switch attention and we sustain attention. There is something that uh, philosophers call uh, intentionality, aboutness, and they, can, they mean something like representation. And in simpler terms, it is a mapping, a neural mapping of the body, of the world, of action, that, that, is, uh, that is represented within us. There is integration through time. Uh, subjective experience things have a duration. There is a flexible evaluative system. We prioritize the kind of stimuli that we get according to the context and salience. There is, uh, we are proactive creatures. We are not re just reactive. All living organisms, by the way, are proactive. Uh, there is embodiment. There is a kind of object-oriented spatial cognition that, is, that requires many degrees of freedom of movement in subjectively experiencing organisms. And there is a kind of registration of self, other, and a stable, uh, and a stable private perspective, a sense of body ownership and ego center. So this is a list of capacities that if we find them in an, in, in, in an entity, we would say, well, there is a very good chance that this entity is something like experiencing creature, not necessarily one that thinks about thoughts or something complicated like us, but something with minimal consciousness, with a minimal ability for subjective experience. And then we looked for a transition model kind of thing, something that a, a, a single capacity, that if we have it, we can say that all this list, that this list of capacity that I, that I showed you in the previous slide has to be in place. And after quite a lot of uh, <laughs> bad starts, we, this, we found a capacity that we called unlimited, the capacity for unlimited associative learning. It is a general, it's a, it's a domain general, generative and recursive learning capacity that requires that the animals can, can do four things. It can distinguish among novel compound patterns of stimuli in action. For example, it can discriminate between a dangerous and self-percept that, that could be very similar but somewhat different in organization. It can learn about new adaptive values and of compound associations and uh, all these learned things, all of the things that unusual to it. They are not reflex the patterns that it learns are not reflex eliciting patterns and they have not been learned in the past. It can also learn when there is a time gap between the neutral complex stimulus, the predictive stimulus in retrospect and the reinforcement. This is called trace conditioning by behaviorists and, and other people who study this kind of conditional behavior. And it requires that, the, that there is some kind of mechanism that stores the, the neutral predictive st uh, uh, stimulus even stores it in some kind of working memory, even when the reinforcing stimulus is transiently unperceived. And the value of the learned uh, pattern can be flexibly changed, so something that is good now can be bad later. And the organ then and the uh, creature with this kind of uh, learning capacity can manifest second order learning, so that the, the, the things that the new complex uh, thing that it learned can be the basis for further learning. So the organism can build, can build up chains of associativeness. Now, this is, you can say this is demanding, but it's not very demanding. A lot of organisms can do all this. And just here is just one example of something that an organism like a mouse can do. A mouse can very easily learn, uh, 
has the capacity for this unlimited associate learning. For example, social learning is one example. It can learn about its environment. It can learn when there are foods, when there is food, when there are, uh, it can learn different routes to the food. It can learn when there are uh, uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous predators. It can, it, uh, it, and it can learn all kinds of uh, where mates may, uh, may be present, a lot, a lot of things. And these things can change in time and it can adapt and update its uh, concept, uh, its uh, understanding of, uh, of this uh, map of the environment uh, in, uh, and, and respond adaptively online. And all the, all the things that I have listed, uh, the global broadcast, the binding ability, the selective attention, all these kind of things, that uh, we say are sufficient for a characterization of the exper experiencing kind of subjectively experiencing mode of being, we, uh, are, all, are marked by unlimited associative learning because unlimited associative learning requires that all these properties are in place. Now, then we, we said, okay, let's build something very, very simple, just a, a simple toy model in order to organize our thought of what this kind of system can be like. And here is some, something very, very simple. What we have here is our, the basic elements of this kind of system. What the system has to do is to have a sensory integrating unit, which integrates sensory information from the body, from the world, and we, we have to have a motor integrating unit that can sort of, uh, uh, that can model prospective action. We have to have a reinforcement unit that can, uh, that can model, uh, that, that can model the inputs that are coming from the body the and, and have particular balance, what is good, what is bad, all the homeostatic signals. We have to have a dedicated memory system that can store compound percepts and create things like cognitive maps, for example, and other types of maps. And all these things have to come together into a kind of central associative units. And this the associative unit, by the way, like all the other units can be distributed or it can be in, uh, or anatomically distributed. Ava, I'm sorry to and disturb you. you have... Ava, you've got four minutes left, please. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I don't have time for this. Okay, so this is a, the, a, and, a, and this unlimited sort of learning is a system property. It, it a, and we have evidence that a, it, a, and moreover, a, we, and the link between this unlimited associative learning and consciousness is that according, if we are right, then we predict that an animal can learn uh, unlimited associative learning tasks such as trace conditioning or discrimination or complex discrimination learning and so on only when it is concept. It cannot do it under conditions of implicit learning. And all the evidence that we have in place, both in, mostly in humans, but also now people are beginning to do it in animals, shows that this is indeed the case. Simpler things can be learned implicitly, but UAL tasks require consciousness, certainly in humans. Okay, so how is this distributed in the in the world? Which any, animal groups uh, show unlimited associative learning? There are three groups. Almost all, probably most all the vertebrates or most of them. Some, uh, many groups of arthropods, and uh, the coleoid mollusks, which are the octopus, the squid, and the and the catfish. All of them show a similar functional brain architecture, although the, architect, uh, although the structural architecture is completely different. And two of them, the arthropod and the vertebrates, appeared first in, in the Cumbrian with the, the supporting brain organization, because we have the fossil evidence for it. The, the cephalopods appeared 250,000 a million years later. Now, we argue that not only were these animals uh, did this uh, did consciousness appear during the Cambrian? What you see here, the the three groups are shown as uh, gray uh, circles with rays, 
Not only did they appear during the Cambrian, but they also were one of the things that drove the Cambrian explosion, the great explosion of animal life on this planet. The, it was what we call following Patrick Bates on the adaptability driver of the Cambrian explosion. This ability to learn led to antagonistic and cooperative arms races and feedbacks, and it was one of the engines of the great explosion. <laughs> and it had all kinds of effects. And one of the effects is that the kind of complex pattern that we see in the world, we would not see them had it not been for the kind of open-ended associative learning which requires, uh, uh, which requ which requires a subjective experience, which is associated, is a facet of a, a subjective experiencing. So for example, the beautiful patterns on this male fish would not be there if there was not a female that was able to identify them and to compare him to other males. The beautiful patterns of the flower would not exist had it not been for arthropods like this dragonfly who could identify them and, and, and discriminate between and make decisions about them. It's very interesting that wind pollinated flowers don't have this kind of complex patterns and, and complex smells as do those that are pollinated by animals. And the beautiful bowerbirds would not, we would not have things of beauty like uh, the bowers built by the bowerbirds. I cannot say any more about the other great, uh, about the great transition to the rational soul. And I want to thank you for your, your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's thank fascinating. You. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, um, oh, sorry. Hang on. Uh, I'm sorry that our format doesn't allow you to continue, uh, but we will no doubt have more in the uh, published accounts in, in time. Fantastic. Um, so um, it's five o'clock, I think, here in the UK. I wish to thank uh, all of our speakers very much for our first session. I'm biased, of course, as one of the organizers, but I, I did think that was an amazing selection of, uh, of talks. And it so happens that our next talk in 90 minutes or so will continue on the uh, on the issue of consciousness, which is clearly a, a, a very relevant uh, factor in, in how uh, teleonomy can affect evolution on the grand scale, as we've just heard. So we now have a 90 minute break. Don't forget to join our final set of four talks for this opening day, which start, I say, in about 90 minutes at 17.30 GMT. That's 6.30 here in the UK, when we will recommence with a paper by Stuart Kaufman and Andrea Rowley. So thank you again to all our speakers and hopefully we'll see you all again in just under an hour and a half. Thank you. <laughs>